Hi, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. Today is Sunday, October 20th, 2019, starting at 10.53 a.m. in Denver, Colorado, and this will be the 228th episode of the show. In this episode, I'm going to be talking with astrologers Austin Kopik and Kelly Surtees about the astrological forecast for November of 2019. Uh, for more information about the show and how to subscribe to it, go to theastrologypodcast.com slash subscribe. Uh, hey guys, welcome to the show. Hey. Hey. Hey, so we're back again. It's been a month, and it's time to uh, get into the astrological forecast for November, where things are finally starting to heat up uh, again, and we're about to get into a really interesting part of the year that everybody's been looking to forward to in December. But first, we got to get through one more month of Jupiter in Sagittarius and Mercury retrograde in Scorpio. So we're going to do the forecast a little differently today. We're going to present the uh, forecast, the astrological forecast and the planetary alignments for November 1st. And then afterwards, in the second half of this show, we're just going to chat about random astrological topics. So usually we do it the other way, but then there's a lot of people that are always asking for like timestamps and how do they skip our boring chats at the beginning so they can go right to the forecast. So we're going to try testing this out and sort of throwing a bone to those people by just doing the forecast first. And then if they want to check out at that point, uh, then they can. For everybody else, they can you know, skip straight to that if they want to. Anyway, um, yeah, where should we start? Let's get into right now when, as we're recording this, Mercury is slowing down and getting ready to station retrograde, but it's not quite there yet. But by the time I release this episode, it'll probably be like right on the Mercury retrograde station that's happening on Halloween in Scorpio, right? Mm hmm. Yeah. So that kind of opens the month in many ways, it seems like, right? Yeah. Well, and that's the, that's one of the, th that's probably the most consistent thing about November. Is uh, Mercury will be retrograde until the twentieth, and will be in Scorpio the entire month. Yeah. And so, it, you know, other than the outer planets, um, that is the most consistent thing about November. It's all Mercury and Scorpio all the time. Little bit retrograde, little bit direct, but uh, in Scorpio the whole time. Yeah, uh, I love that because then when a planet slows down and stations in just one sign, you really get a much better feel for what that planet, especially that inner planet like Mercury, is like all about. Um, one of the things I was doing, I threw out on Twitter earlier this week, was like talking about famous Mercury and Scorpio placements, and some people threw out some pretty good ones. I was curious if you guys have like a favorite Mercury in Scorpio example that comes to mind. See, well, so I was aware of, so I believe you and Watson threw out, Patrick Watson, um, threw out Eminem and then Weird Al Yankovic, whose parodies of Eminem were brilliant. Um, right. Those are both Mercury and Scorpios. I can contribute uh, Alistair Crowley, who mm -hmm. had um, mm -hmm. Mercury and Jupiter both in the first decade of Scorpio. Um, and so I think that, I don't know, his reputation probably makes a lot of sense as far as a Mercury and Scorpio. Um, he was you know, obviously obsessed with magic and mysteries and the occult. And also, as not everyone might know, um, like Eminem and like Weird Al Yankovic, a, um, a relentless troll. Right. <laughs> I was thinking about the episode I did on Evangeline Adams and one of the things where he had a falling out with her and he wrote this just like screed about horoscope writers that was like a very thinly veiled attack on he, her but yeah he also wrote uh he wrote an essay on um uh Arthur Waite um and people may know Waite from the writer Waite Smith tarot he was one of the designers of that very popular tarot deck and he called that essay dead weight Mm. Okay. About his uselessness. <laughs> right. Uh, but yeah, Very that clever. earlier one that you mentioned, Eminem was my favorite one. And obviously, there's a lot more going on there because he's like a Libra with uh, Sun and Libra with Mercury and Scorpio, and he has Saturn and Gemini. And he was going through a sort of Saturn return during the height of his popularity in the early 2000s. So obviously, there's a lot more going on there. But it's just funny thinking back, especially to a lot of his earlier music. Um, 
and how so what's the word like acerbic it was in many ways as part of the reputation and the way that he expressed himself despite being a Libra but having that Mercury in Scorpio. Mm -hmm. Love yeah, it. Yeah, I think I think all three of our examples are Sun and Libra. Okay. Um, what about you, Kelly? Do you have yeah, one? Yeah, the one that first came to mind when you mentioned that was a previous Prime Minister of Australia, Julia Gillard, who was this incredibly sort of sharp, intelligent woman. And she's very famous for a speech about misogyny, which she gave in Parliament, sort of attacking, you know, the opposite party and, and some of their views, I guess. And I think she actually gave that speech when Saturn in Scorpio was on her Mercury in Scorpio. So that's a really interesting one, just sort of speaking up from her perspective about um, how women were being treated according to the issues of the day. And I think that speech is actually on YouTube if anyone is interested to, uh, to check it out. But she's the first one. She's also a son in Libra, actually. I was just having a quick check um, of that. Um, yeah, so there's that mix, if you like. Um, and the other one, funnily enough, is a poet, uh, Rainier Maria Rilke, who mm. is a um, – I love his writing and I often quote some of his poetry when I'm talking about Mercury and Scorpio, about the truth-telling but the depth um, – you know, there's a quote of his that says something like, you know, you're not, I'm just paraphrasing here, but something like, you're not dead yet. Um, it's not too late to dive into your depths and, and to find what's kind of hiding in there. And Mercury in his chart is like 29 Scorpio. So mm, that's interesting. It's very and sort of, yeah, the darkness of Rilke. Yeah. And he's actually a sun in Sag. And it's, yeah, it's not just darkness. It's like, there's also, you know, the, uh, the the juiciness of hidden rivers of blood. There, it's very passionate, and it's yes. very it's you know it's the depths of passion, right? It's yes. very um, elementally watery, um, but it's like you know, um, yes, throbbing life force sort of uh, water, not not tepid water. No, uh, no, no. I, I was thinking of that because I previously I think on the Zodiac series I had used um, like ice as a mercury and scorpio descriptor like an ice cube uh, mm -hmm. but i was thinking about that earlier today and that doesn't actually make as much sense because it's like a mars ruled sign and mars tends to be much more hot and much more fiery so it's more like hot water or water that's been rapidly brought to a boil and the funny imagery i thought of actually for scorpio was a hot tub or like a jacuzzi would be <laughs> great imagery for scorpio we all know what happens in hot tubs um, <laughs> right. yeah I I so for for Scorpio for Scorpio water that that fixed but martial water I usually use um water which is flowing in a consistent direction such as in a fierce river or through mm. a sewer system of right where it's it's always system. it's always moving always moving yeah. always moving but it's still fixed you know its course you know where yeah. the river is headed and also you know blood like arteries Right, right, arteries yeah. and veins, They're like always flowing but fixed in direction. As a Scorpio, I'm going to go ahead and stick with my jacuzzi analogy instead of your <laughs> sewer analogy, but I appreciate nonetheless the imagery. Well, you know, the, the, I mean, you know, if you think about the, the rivers of blood within you, um, it's important to have uh, a sewer system, right? If your blood couldn't clean itself, right, um, then you'd be dead. Yes. Sure. Um, okay. <laughs> well, I think it is important to keep in mind what you guys are talking about. Mercury is in a sign ruled by Mars. So there is a sharpness or a directness or a piercing quality to words and communication as Mercury goes through Scorpio. And as you said, Austin, it's Mercury and Scorpio all the time this month, sometimes retrograde, sometimes not. Uh, but it is, I mean, if you've never read Rilke's poetry, <laughs> this might be a good month <laughs> to, uh, to try some of it. Uh, but it's very piercing. You know, there's nothing that is left unexplored or unsaid, no matter how sharp or direct it might be. So there it is. We open with November 1st. Mercury is retrograde already conjunct Venus. Venus quickly change, changes signs that same day and moves into Sagittarius. And the Mer Mercury basically spends the rest of the month in Scorpio before eventually stationing about three weeks later into November. 
Yeah. Well, and so it's worth noting here that Mercury during this retrograde is really not strongly configured to much, right? Its ruler Mars is in Libra um, for almost the entire time that Mercury is retrograde. Mars does move into Scorpio later in the month, but just as the retrograde is leaving off. And yeah. weirdly, uh, as, literally, almost simultaneously as Mercury stationing direct is when Mars joins the party. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and then Venus leaves, uh, Venus leaves Scorpio for Sagittarius um, a day after Mercury turns retrograde. And so, you know, Mercury has a sextile with the Saturn Pluto stuff in Cap, and it, ha- it makes a trine to Neptune and Pisces, but, you know, no angles. No. Um, uh, you know, no angular configuration to anything. Um, no, you know, uh, 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 no real configuration to Mars, which is its ruler. And so this is, um, you know, th- this is a somewhat less eventful retrograde, uh, Mercury retrograde than the other ones that we've experienced this year. You know, the the two previous Mercury retrogrades this year were both right on top of everything and right in the mix. Um, yeah. Whereas this one has some space to do its own thing, which is um, which is nice. It's not that there won't be some of the standard Mercury retrograde, um, you know, types of events and experiences, but there's a little room for that. It's not crowded um, and it's not on top of malefics and during eclipse season and, you know, all of that business that we experienced earlier. Yeah. That's oh, a I, have point. A, I have a, I have a great, um, the sort of future anecdote about this Mercury retrograde. So okay. I had scheduled myself um, to do the full, like to finish my second edition rewrite of 36 faces um, during basically uh, during second half of October and get it done um, in November. Now this is, you know, it's, Oh, it's a Mercury retrograde. You're rewriting. Yes, but there's more. Also, I am in um, I am in a fifth house perfection, right? Fifth is literally the fifth is um, what you create, right? Mm-hmm. This is literally a book I have created. My fifth house is Scorpio, and yeah. so Mercury's retrograde through my perfected fifth house is literally rewriting my creation, like. You kind of can't beat that. It's just you couldn't make it up, right? It's like and, it's so classic. Yeah, and I didn't schedule that, uh, or I did schedule that, but I didn't do it with that in mind. So I was like, "Oh, well, that's of course I'm doing that then." That makes yeah. good sense. That's easier to do with a book than like rewriting a child or something. Other fifth house topic. <laughs> yeah. Not sure how well, that symbolism would manifest. It's um. I love that story, Austin. And a little personal one for me is that Scorpio is ninth house for me. So this is uh, Mercury retro is happening in my ninth house, which is with international bits and bobs. And I just heard actually about my Canadian citizenship uh, test, which I applied to do some time ago. And I literally just got an email as Mercury slowing down saying, can you show up in two weeks back in Canada to take this test? And I've had to reply, Uh, no, I cannot. And here's why, because we're somewhere else in the world right now. So having to look at rescheduling that citizenship test based on our like international relocation. So you're still going to take it even though you've relocated to a different country under the premise that you might go, you'll go back at some point? Oh yeah. We are actually considered to be uh, somehow still legally domiciled resident in Canada because we're here on a defense posting, if that makes oh, sense. Right, right. Okay. And we, we we will be returning um once the posting here is done. So yeah. So that's, that's like a good Mercury retrograde classic. in the ninth. Mercury retrograde in the ninth documents to do with international and we've got to reschedule. So don't uh, you know that's a to be continued. I don't have an answer for that one yet. Um, yeah. So love I- that that's showing up so classically for each of us. And what about you, Chris? Um, I'm trying to just like avert Mercury retrograde issues. I had my my laptop died like two days before <gasps> Mercury went into its shadow on October 11th. Yeah. So I was kind of scrambling because every time this happens, then I'll get a new laptop right about the time it's going retrograde, and then I'll just go deal with like three weeks of hassles and having to return it and having like the new laptop not work and all sorts of weird stuff. So I tried to get it in before it went into its shadow, 
and yeah. but I'm I'm holding and I got the laptop and it's working out well so far. But I'm keeping the box, and I realize that's a great piece of advice. If you get something, you make it significant, especially like a technology purpose during a Mercury retrograde, is is keep the box. Like sometimes, like you buy something new, you throw the box away. You're like, I don't need that, but then it turns out you need to like send it back or return it or something. And if you don't have that, it's kind of a hassle. Agree entirely. Um, there were a few new home purchases that we made during the previous Mercury retrograde where we really wish we'd kept the box. Yeah. <laughs> totally. So I'm really struck by how almost sort of, because that's a work thing for you, Chris, isn't it? This is a 10th house retro for you. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. going to be a major work thing. I'm also, I just re redesigned, uh, I put out that call last month uh, for. Um, you know, help doing website redesigns, and I've started some of that and started working with uh, a lovely astrologer and website designer named Cat Rose Nelligan, uh, who does a podcast, and she helped me redesign my consulting site. And we're talking about redesigning some other stuff, like the podcast website and other things like that, because I've got too many websites, I need to consolidate some of them. Um, but yeah, and then of course we'll be having you guys out, and that's going to be a major turning point in terms of the podcast and everything because we're going to have. I think you're calling it astrologer summer camp, right, Kelly? Well, I was calling it sleepaway camp, but I don't want anyone to get murdered, so maybe we'll come up. We'll, maybe we'll call it like our think week or something like that. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, funny. Yeah. yeah. So you guys are coming out here next month, and we're going to record like four or five episodes. We're going to do the December forecast the uh, 2020 year ahead forecast in person yes. here in the studio. And then we're going to do our long awaited two part series on the significations of the 12 houses. And maybe something else or is that it? Yeah, maybe like a QA. and a Like if we can squeeze yep. in a Q&A, we'll do it. Uh, you know, maybe we could squeeze in like a drunk astrology podcast, something like that. I don't know. We'll oh my see. Lord. I'm not sure uh, if I can do that on camera. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll see we'll what happens. See. We'll see what happens with peer pressure. Um, but I'm I'm curious. I think for our listeners to think about what house this Mercury retro and Scorpio is happening in your chart, because as you mentioned, Austin, it's kind of a um, it's not interfered with, if you like. It's just Mercury doing retro and Scorpio, and so there may be just some very topical things to do with the house that Mercury's retro in in your in your chart for listeners. Yeah. So, yeah. and some people, the Mercury retrograde will be a big deal for other people. It won't, especially if you're in a annual perfection year where Gemini or Virgo are activated, that retrograde could be a bigger deal for you. Or if it's hitting crucial part in your chart, like let's say it's going through your ascendant or going over the sun in your day chart or the moon in your night chart, then it might be more significant. Cool. Yep. And if it, you know, what if it goes over a planet? Right, then you mm. want to look at the house or houses that planet rules, and if those are activated by other things. Well, yeah, and so the degrees that Mercury we retrograde is from twenty-seven Scorpio back to eleven Scorpio. So if you've got any planets in your chart in that zone, or your ascendant, or MC, or descendant, that can be more, make this retrograde a little more relevant. Right. So what are what are degrees again? Again, what did you say? Twenty-seven back to eleven. 27 to 11. Okay. Yeah. So anything in that range, but especially around that, especially if you got anything around 27 Scorpio or if you have anything around 11 Scorpio, uh, that could be more crucial for you than others. All right. Um, so that's the Mercury retrograde that's going to dominate like the first three weeks of the month. Um, but that is not the only thing we have going on this month, right? No, it's not. Okay. No, so I'm... let's. Yeah, go ahead. Maybe let's do it uh, chronologically, and let's start going through some of these. So here's the planetary alignments for the month of November. We can see the ingress of Venus into Sagittarius right away on the first of the month. Um, one of the other things mentioned very early on is Saturn sextile Neptune goes exact on the 8th of November. Uh, then a few days later, we have the halfway point through the Mercury retrograde cycle where the Sun conjoins Mercury on November 11th in, mm -hmm. at Scorpio. Uh, so that's the halfway point in the retrograde cycle. The day after that, we have the full Moon in Taurus. Then about a week later, we jump forward to Mercury ingressing into Scorpio on November 19th. Mars? Uh, Mars. Or, sorry, yeah, Mars ingressing into Scorpio, and that happens 
nearly almost simultaneously as Mercury stationing direct in Scorpio on the 20th of November, followed, of course, by the annual ingress of the Sun into Sagittarius on November 22nd. Uh, then at the end of the month, we have Venus quickly moving into Capricorn on the 25th, uh, New Moon in Sagittarius on the 26th, and Neptune stationing direct on the 27th of November. So those are the major things. Are there any like major alignments that I didn't note note here? Uh I mean I don't know if I would necessarily say it's super major, but having Venus conjunct Jupiter um is going to be a nice one. Uh I think it's November 24th around 24 degrees Sag. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and that is our electional chart. When we're going to be feeling that for weeks and weeks you know that's the other theme yeah venus isn't in sagittarius the entire month but it's almost the entire month yeah and so we've got mercury and scorpio direct and otherwise and then we have venus in sag right co-present sharing the sign with jupiter from the first until what was that was that the 26th? 25th 25th yeah so that's yeah 25 days that's yeah. a nice amount of time I'll take and this it. is this is like one of the last great flourishes of Jupiter and Sagittarius. Basically, is this lovely conjunction with Venus later in November and most of November, but building up most of November and then culminating around the twenty third, twenty fourth, and twenty fifth. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about Venus and Sag. Let's do that. So Kelly, you're the you're the Venus expert. What do well, you? Uh, <laughs> um, you I have just the flowers. I have the flowers. Uh, it, it's, first of all, I mean, I love the change of Venus out of Scorpio into Sag. And when I, when you see this in client work with progressions and things like that, it's such a sense of freedom, not just because Sag could be about freedom, but because Venus is moving out of a place where she's been locked or limited because she's uncomfortable and, you know, in her detriment in Scorpio. And so there is a sense of lightness and this idea of, going from looking inwards and, and very introspective to starting to look outwards at possibilities. And so that sense of returning to a sense of perspective or hope or possibility, if, if hope is too strong, it's least, at least you're starting to see movement. And it is, this is actually the second cycle of Venus through Sag this year with Jupiter. We had that back in January and early February. So there is perhaps some rec, um, resonance with that time frame for some people, but it's just such an uplift of hopeful connective energy that it feels like there's going to be a lot of maybe happy encounters or positive plans. I know Mercury's retrograde and I understand logistics are going to be tricky, but there is this real sense of we can do this or I'm willing to take this leap or I'm going to give this thing a shot. How would you guys describe it? Because I know you'll have a lot of thoughts on this too, Austin. Um, well, let's see. Um, I think, well, one, we'll be seeing the best, ver like the best case scenario of Venus and Sag um, this particular time because we've got um, the, ruler, uh, the ruler of Sag, Jupiter, in the sign with Venus, right? Yeah. Um, and so that's, you know, that a planet that's in the sign, uh, in the same sign as its ruler is going to be abundantly provided for, right? All of the, that's all a the beautiful way of saying it. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's all, all the Jupiterian fixins, right? Um, let's see. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I like Venus in Sag. Um, it's much less personal than Venus in Scorpio, even though Venus is in its detriment in or in Scorpio. Mm -hmm. um, Scorpio is, you know, it's a water sign and Venus has a very strong proclivity uh, for water signs, being one of the triplicity rulers of water signs. Um, and I would say, you know, if we look at Venus's uh, uh, contribution to temperaments, we have cool and moist, right, which are the qualities of water. Um, and so Venus and Sag can be um, emotionally disconnected mm -hmm. um, and, you know, sort of, uh, what should we say, um, excited about the exciting things that are exciting. Um, <laughs> yes. 
and I, I think excitement is a good thing. It doesn't, um, you know, it doesn't have, uh, it doesn't have a tremendous amount of depth or weight, um, but that's okay. Um, you know, we'll be getting, we'll be getting depth from, uh, from other places here. I think it's, I think it's nice. Um, you know, it's probably not the right part of the year to be setting off on totally new adventures. Um, you know, we've got a nice adventure coming up. You know, we we'll be do traveling, be traveling to the, um, the forbidding mountains of Denver. Um, <laughs> But you know it's it's a you know it's a good mood. It's uh, and I think the ways to uh, the way to further activate it is do adventurous things. You know, questy things, adventury things. You know, tonight we ride. Um, it's that kind of feeling. Yeah, I mean, it has a real sense of like hope and like optimism when Jupiter and Venus come together in a sign like Sagittarius more than I can almost think of any other sign. Well, um, it, Pisces would be vastly superior from a, a essential dignity perspective. Yeah, it would be, but it's not going to have that outward "let's ride" vibe. Right. It's not going to be as it'll be idealistic, uh, but not as like like optimism is almost more of a Sagittarius vibe to me. Um, which is interesting because I keep thinking of it in terms of the contrast with what happens. Pretty much immediately after this month in December, when just everything goes into Capricorn and we have everything moving through, you know, the darker Saturn ruled sign uh, and really setting up most of next year uh, during the course of the month of December. And, and the contrast then with that and everything moving to Capricorn is makes it so much more stark and makes the just how bright that transit of Venus through Sagittarius conjoining Jupiter looks in comparison. Yeah, it's like the the opposite of it's always darkest before the dawn. Right. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. It's opposite <laughs> month. <laughs> you're right, Chris. It is it is quite a change. There's a sobering energy that comes in in December. So you want to get the quest out now. I like the distinction you made, Austin, around the less intimate quality of Venus in Sag, that she's maybe less connected at that personal level and more interested in, you know, the outward experience, if you like. Yeah. I, um, with Venus and Sag natives, I see, um, so I don't want this to sound superficial, but there's almost like the, the movie of what's happening is just as interesting as what's happening. Like, what mm. things you know like that you know that something amazing is happening it's a little instagrammy oh, <laughs> like the best version of something yeah yeah well it's the the vision of the yeah. best version yeah um, and but um you know I, I would say as far as emotions um venus and sag is really good for excitement um positivity the being ready for the best and to bring the best um, you know, I think it's a good place for, as far as Venus goes, there are some places that are good for Venus that are nonetheless very counterproductive, uh, for getting things done, mm. for getting work done. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and Venus and Sag is, is good for, you know, doing, you know, going and getting your work done and being awesome and feeling awesome and, you know, feeling like you're doing a good job, which, you know, feeds your desire to accomplish things. It's uh, it's just, it's worth noting that it, you know, Venus doesn't have any essential dignity in Sagittarius except for one bound. Um, yeah, just in so, terms. Yeah. And so I, I don't want to oversell it. Like it's nice and this is the best possible version. Um, but yeah, you know, there, there's not a lot of, um, what should we say? There's not a lot of opportunity for lasting work um that venus uh has here you know it's 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 basically like hanging it's like being jupiter's flavor flave uh for a month nice uh Which, yeah and you've got a do you have a chart you want to share chris no i was just what you mean the election yeah should i yeah i mean i should well, I this, is basic, this is basically the election we're looking at it right now so i guess i'll go ahead and introduce that so our, our electional chart where uh, Lisa Scheim and I pick out one 
auspicious electional chart where we find the date during the course of the entire month that looks like it's uh, the most positive or most auspicious in terms of planetary alignments for starting different types of ventures and undertakings using the principles of electional astrology. And the month or the day specifically that we came up with this month is uh, November 23rd, um, right around the middle part of the day. Uh, the exact time, I guess, is like roughly you would set the time to around, let's say, 1.24 p.m. In your location, in your city, and set the chart so that it has Pisces rising. So if you set it up like that, you'll end up with a chart that has um, Pisces rising. The ruler of the ascendant is Jupiter, which is located in Sagittarius in its own sign in the tenth house, um, in a day chart. So that it's of the sect in favor. Uh, it has no affliction from malefics. It's pretty much an aversion to, to Mars and Saturn, so it has no aspect to either of them. It does have an applying aspect from Venus, which is at 27 degrees of Sagittarius, applying to a conjunction with Jupiter, which is a helpful and affirming or stabilizing influence that Venus is bringing into the table to help out Jupiter, the ruler of the Ascendant. Uh, Jupiter is also the ruler of the 10th house of career, reputation, and um, action, so it's a good general purpose chart for uh, things where you have to make a good public impression or have to accomplish something in terms of business or just actions in general. Uh, the moon in this chart is at 24 degrees of Libra, and it's applying to a sextile with Venus with reception, uh, followed by a sextile with Jupiter. So the moon is also applying to both of the benefics in this chart, and that's strengthened through the reception. It's not in a great house because it's actually in the eighth house, but this is mitigated somewhat by the fact that it's applying to two angular planets very closely. So that's not a huge deal. Um, we would recommend setting the time so that if you can in your location, try to make the midheaven sextile to the moon, like we have in this chart set for Denver, where we set the midheaven at 24 degrees of Sagittarius. So it's exactly sextile to the moon at 24 Libra. If you do that, it will completely mitigate that eighth house placement of the moon. So you'll have more positive manifestations coming from that, like things having to do with shared resources or other people's money or um, things like that. Um, it's a little tricky because even though this is well, the best. Go Chris, ahead. I just want to jump in. Another thing that mitigates that moon is mm -hmm. it's right next to Spico. Yeah. Which right. is a very uh, friendly fixed star. Very friendly. Yeah. Um, and the only downside to this chart is by this point in the month, Mars has already, this is right after Mercury is stationed direct. It's literally just stationed direct three days earlier at 11 degrees of Scorpio. So that's the other thing that's nice is we're able to take advantage of the Venus Jupiter conjunction. And we're also at the very tail end of Mercury, the Mercury retrograde period. So Mercury is actually direct by this point. Which is the other reason why this is one of the best elections of November compared to, let's say, some of the earlier ones where Mercury was still retrograde. The only downside that I'm not that thrilled about is that Mars has already ingressed into Scorpio at this point. And like all of the planets that have transited through Scorpio so far this year, I think Mars is the last inner planet that has to make that trip. Um, Mars is coming up on an opposition with Uranus at three degrees of Taurus, which adds a little element of instability, a little element of erraticness that I'm not super thrilled about, but I think all other things considered and the fact that Mars is otherwise not a major player in the chart, uh, that should be okay and should be doable. Yeah, I um, the, one of the things that that makes me think of immediately, I've been rereading Firmicus and Mars, uh, Mars, uh, strong Mars in the ninth uh, with Mercury in a day chart. Um, this would be a good time for uh, abominable heresy against the gods and the emperor. <laughs> Is this going to be our transition again into advertising for our sponsor this month? Last month, uh, they <laughs> you, we started talking about the Antichrist, and then that was our transition into the honeycomb, which did pretty well despite that. So we might actually want to repeat that if it, since it seemed to have gone relatively well. Okay, well, I've got plenty of abominable heresy 
Um, okay. Having right. Mars in the ninth in a day chart. <laughs> okay. Well, save your satanic imagery for later in the episode then once we transition into the uh, promotional aspect of this episode. Um, Kelly, Got what do you it. think about the chart? Yeah, look, I was uh, picking up what Austin had. I thought that moon is, I know it's in the eighth, but it's so beautifully placed on speaker, which is, it's around 23 Libra. It's just generally a helpful, uplifting kind of star. It can offer some protection or some insight. It's one of those stars that if you can get in a chart, it's always nice to have. And yeah, the aspect from the moon to the MC degree, as you've got it in Denver location is helping partially mitigate the eighth. I really like the moon, Venus, Jupiter interplay there. All right, good. Well, I'm, I'm glad you guys this, like this chart because yeah. this is the chart. This is the chart we're using to record our year ahead forecast, and this is the chart that we've basically centered your trip to Denver around next month. Where the three I did of us think gonna, it looked familiar, right? Yeah, I remember this. <laughs> yeah. So this is hopefully, if all goes well, when we will press the record button to begin recording our 2020 year ahead forecast, which we'll release in December. Uh, although I'll release it earlier than that for early access to patrons who are signed up on the early access tiers through our page on Patreon. So we're going to use this chart. We've got some other charts we're going to use that week for other lesser episodes, but I think this is the one we want to focus on for the year ahead. The yeah. biggie. Yeah. Right. All right. So um, yeah, that's the electional chart for this month. Uh, there's going to be three or four other electional charts. So if you want to get access to those, they're available through our private subscription only Auspicious Elections podcast, which is available to patrons on the five and ten dollar tiers through our page on Patreon. All right, so um, that's the electional chart. What are the other major alignments this month? Should we start talking about like lunations, like the first lunation? Yeah, we we need to circle back. I think to that mid month period centered around the full moon in Taurus, Austin. Okay. Would you? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's so there's just a lot happening. Right, so Mercury or Mercury kicks off the month with being retrograde. Venus moves into Sag on the first, and then once we get to the eleventh, twelfth, we've got a couple things. Couple of things. Couple there of things. So, yeah. The moon. We get the Sun Mercury, uh, the conjunction midway point. I think is on the eleventh. Yeah, and people often pay so much attention to Mercury stationing retrograde and Mercury stationing direct, but the that conjunction with the Sun and Mercury is arguably just as important of a turning point in the Mercury retrograde cycle, and really deserves a lot of attention if you're paying attention to Mercury retrogrades and trying to like time things. Do you guys agree with that? I've I've been saying it for a decade. Hundred um, percent. So one thing that's particularly cool about this one is that uh, Mercury will actually be at the same declination as the Sun, and so that means we're actually going to have Mercury trying to eclipse the Sun, like a bumblebee trying to eclipse a basketball. Wow. Um, and so this is the, uh, the astronomical term is it's a transit of Mercury, which of course mm. overlaps unhelpfully with our astrological terms. But yes. so, you know, if, if we're thinking about a planet in the heart of the sun, Kazemi, um, then this is as Kazemi as it gets. Yeah. And transit, the original Greek term for transit was epimbosis, which means to step upon or to like walk across something. So mm. that's where that Ooh. term comes from. And that's why that's what Mercury will literally be doing in this instance is literally you'll see a little you know planet just like start walking across the sun for a brief period of time when it moves in front of it what 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 was the greek term again chris uh epimbosis epimbosis okay yeah love it i mean i love that imagery and then also the idea that this conjunction is happening at 18 scorpio which i think is inside the bounds of mercury in scorpio just to add a little extra Mercury mojo. It's the, the the last degree of the bounds. Yeah. The the bound of Mercury within Scorpio for clarity. Within sake. Scorpio, yeah. Very nice. So this is the the halfway point in the Mercury retrograde. There's also often a, a turning point that occurs around mm. this time, so that whatever the sometimes like crisis was or the problem that was set up around the time of Mercury stationing retrograde. And then being retrograde for the first week or so, often you'll see uh, things reach a crucial or a pivotal turning point at this point where 
the issues start to recede, or at least the solution to the issues starts to become clear and starts to manifest in the person's life. So whatever the problem was that you needed to deal with, you start working through and sort of working out so that you start to see that there might be an end in sight by this point. Yeah. Yeah, it's the uh yeah, the um it's the the revelation at, at the at the bottom of the underworld. Um it's the uh being it's that point where walking through the forest lost. If you just keep walking, you're now walking out of the forest. Yes. Right? Yeah, it's, it reminds me of a part, and I'm going to be maybe butchering this a little bit, like in the hero's journey where you've kind of figured out sort of what you're doing in there, and now, yeah, you can make your way. That It's that b- beginning of the return. Yeah, yeah, it, because it's literally, and, you know, from a visibility perspective, that's as invisible as Mercury gets. Um, yeah. uh, all movement from this point forward is on the way to a return to visibility. Mm. This is, you know, in in as far as narrative structure, this is the the coming out of the underworld, right? Yes. Brilliant. Which is interesting to play off that piece around visibility and darkness is that this happens just the day before the full moon in Taurus. Yeah. Good segue. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, there it is. So the very next day, the moon, which is already in Taurus at that point, um, actually passing over that conjunction with Uranus right around the time that Mercury is hitting the exact conjunction with the sun. But about a day mm. later, the moon hits 19 degrees of Taurus where it opposes the sun and the moon thus reaches the height of its um, emitting of light, it, its peak brightness. And we have a full moon that goes exact in Taurus at this time on November 12th. Mm-hmm. So that analogy, we get a, like almost repetition of the symbolism you're talking about, Austin, where Mercury reaches that middle point in the cycle, and then the sort of begin of a return to visibility. And at the same time, we have the Moon um, at its peak visibility and peak sort of emitting of light and lighting up the sort of darkness surrounding it at night. Hmm. And I like this Moon because it's uncomplicated. Yeah. Um, you know, the moon the moon's exalted in Taurus. Um it's you know, it is not only good at moon stuff, it avoids um it avoids the error that you get in Cancer where the moon is also strong where it's things are too sloshy, right? The moon's mm. one of the moon's problems is that it changes too much. Right? Yes. When you look at delineations for the moon, it's like, "Oh, it's changeable." And so the moon in Taurus provides for manifestation, materialization, nurturance, et cetera, et cetera. But it does so in a stabilizing way, right? That fixed earth from Taurus mm-hmm. is very helpful. Um, and the moon is largely left to its own devices here. We have, you know, we have a trine to Pluto and it's coming off of a trine to Saturn. Um, we have a, you know, a loose sextile with Neptune it's completely unconfigured to Mars. It's not, it's ruler. Uh, Venus is in a good place, but it's unconfigured. And so, you know, we might get a little bit of, a uh, little bit of Saturn flavor from that trine, but it's by trine and it's mm. departing, it's separating. And so it's really, um, you know, I think this moon in Taurus will feel like a moon in Taurus. Um, there, the other planets aren't in places where they can testify um, you know, with Against, overwhelming, yeah, yeah, overwhelming vigor. Yeah, I do have a bit of a bias to the full moon in Taurus each year, and I know it varies depending on the testimony of other planets. But it's it's one of the full moons that I really like, just as a starting point. What you're talking about, Austin, that it is stabilizing. The energy of Taurus is so anchoring for the moon, which otherwise can, you know, flit around so much. So it's almost that cliche grounding type energy where you can be in your body or be in the present, or you might be, you know, feeding your body well or nourishing or pampering your body in some way, but you might also be just having a chance to catch your breath and pause, you know, to do some reflection from that place of, of a moment stillness. I know Uranus is in Taurus, but it's quite separated by degree. Uh, and so I love that idea of of the stabilizing, the earthiness of that full moon. Uh, yeah. 
two things really quickly. One, did you guys notice that Aries full moon that happened this month? I I saw in some people's lives was much more crucial than uh, it should have been, or than I anticipated it being. And I realized in retrospect, it's because it was the halfway point between the Cancer Capricorn eclipse series that we're in. And I forgot what a crucial turning point that is when you get the full moon that falls in between two eclipses, because it's almost like the continuation or the next turning point in this series connected with those those eclipse series. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it was also square Pluto by degree and trine Jupiter by degree and yeah. had Saturn and Mars angular. It was there was a lot there's 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 a lot um on deck for that one and what's interesting with both um yeah like square the nodes um uh, with the with there being both a really powerful benefic influence with the perfect jupiter trine mm. as well as a variety of malefic influences i saw it go both ways for people i was talking with my my students um my classes after that happened and some people had a great time. Some people had a fucking awful time. Um, but, uh, you know, it was really, it, there was so much on deck there in addition to just the moon. And so that's in many ways the opposite of what we're dealing with here. We're yeah. really, this is a full moon in Taurus. How do you like Taurus and moon? Because that's, yeah. what's, you know, like that's, that's what's on the menu. It's we're, just, there's not a lot of choice here, but we are offering a high quality. I mean, if, if, if it was a menu to use that metaphor, Austin, it's like organic grass fed or totally locally grown. You know, it's very high quality nourishment. It's, it's actually it's, just an all beef menu. Yeah, I was going to say, but there isn't a lot of choice. <laughs> yeah. Where's that last one had all sorts of things. It was like a buffet. Would you like a half eclipse Pluto, but with Jupiter sauce and maybe yeah. some <laughs> Mars angular, but not by degree aspecting? With a bit you know. of satin and yeah, the the Aries full moon was yeah, it was definitely dramatic and it it had a lot of indications of being quite explosive. Uh, one of the things though that's a little unique about this moon is it's one of the first full moons where we have Uranus now firmly in Taurus, and I've been noticing for some of the people where Taurus is like a dominant sign in their chart, it's been interesting watching some of those people like Taurus risings, for example. Who are going through periods of like a, a Uranus transit through their first house and are like seeking mm. liberation and breaking away from old structures and things like that. Um, but then it's interesting seeing how they, how other people in those people's lives are dealing with that. Because sometimes I was realizing when you're dealing with somebody in your life that's going through like a heavy Uranus transit and what they're experiencing is. Sudden, like liberation and breaking away from constraints, is sometimes experienced by other people in their life. Like that person's acting very erratic right now, and this is like disrupting old relationships, and is um, can sometimes be difficult to deal with if you're not the one that's going through the sort of more liberating phase of that. Yes, one person's liberation is another person's. I don't know, irritation, maybe. Not yeah. even irritation. It's it's when you're the person seeking the change because it's going to liberate you. It can feel like bo you're setting bombs off in the lives of others. I I remember many years ago, I was maybe uh, going to be I was doing some business with and was maybe going to start a business with a friend who was having Uranus transit the degree of his ascendant, and he was like, "Yeah, we could do that," or. I kind of want to just live on a boat. <laughs> this was in Pisces. This was uh, yeah, you were on in Pisces. And yeah. he was like, "Yeah, that all sounds good, but I kind of want to just live on a boat." And I was like, and I checked, and I was like, "Oh yeah, Uranus is on your ascendant by degree. Yeah, you want to live on a boat, <laughs> right?" I mean, but it's maybe good advice then for people going through Uranus transit to maybe have patience with other people in their lives that might not be in board. Or still struggling to adapt to their sudden, rapid, like complete life overhauls, and develop a little bit of patience for those that are still catching up with where you're rapidly going in new directions. Yeah, it, it can be totally authentic for you to flee the tyranny of land and go live on a boat, right. but just can consider that how that may affect other people. Don't don't not do it. You know, 
I guess with Taurus now, I guess it would be fleeing the uh, fleeing the uh, the ocean uh, for the for the land <laughs> for, for the sweet embrace of Terra. Yeah, um, but whatever, you know. I think that's great advice, Chris. And yeah, that that goes both ways. If you have you know, if you have someone in your life who's going through Uranus, or if you're the someone, like you know, some understanding. And I well, would also yeah. I would also add that when you're in the middle of the series of conjunctions, um, a lot of people do experiments with their life and mm-hmm. experiments yield valuable data, whether they are successful or not. Um, yes. But, um, you know, give them a little time. They may not settle on the current, the like the current experiment. Um, you know, sometimes I see people hugely concerned that a change someone has made is going to, well, if they do this with their life, then, you know, then this and this and this and this are going to proceed from that. When somebody's in the middle of a couple years of Uranus conjunctions, they do stuff and then they do other stuff. It's not like one, it's usually not one change and then it's done. Absolutely not. It's a series of changes. And some of the things often say to clients with Uranus transit is, you know, your pace is not going to be everyone else's. So be mindful that you want to move quickly and other people may need time to adjust. But the trial and error experimentation piece, Austin, for sure. It's like you do this one thing and you get some stuff out of it, but usually you'll have a sequence of at least two, but possibly more changes. And if you are in this middle of a series of Uranus transits, keep in mind that your timelines are much shorter. Don't think about making a five-year plan. Just think about a three to six-month plan and then reassess because everything is moving so quickly that you couldn't possibly commit to something, you know, 12 months or two years out at that point in time. It's like Uranus is the archetype of the mad scientist, except your laboratory is like your life and you're your just life. like <laughs> reconfiguring things. Happen? Yeah. Yes. If I move this here and- And you don't know, this. the the tricky thing, and I think especially with Uranus in Taurus, you can't anticipate what it's going to be like until you pour the thing in the test tube or move that piece of your life somewhere else. You won't know what it looks and feels like or whether it's right for you. You have to get into the lived experience of it. And that's why it seems a little hectic from the outside looking in. Absolutely. And I would say that Uranus pushes us to the edges of the known and has us gazing at the unknown. Right, like Uranus isn't int- doesn't uh, doesn't pull our attention towards what we already have data. on. Uh-uh. it's once well, the unfamiliar. It's like this is different. This is outside my realm of experience, and now I'm curious about it because that's I think what Uranus does is it arouses that curiosity or that willingness and to the go into the restlessness. The restlessness. It's it's like you can say restlessness to someone having a Uranus transit, and they totally get it because it, they are bored. They're and they they get itchy. They Very get itch, itchy, yeah. And they and they stop bec- they if they've previously been they stop being risk averse in that area. They, yeah, they're like, yeah, whatever. I'm so yeah. sick of this. I'm willing to roll the dice to try almost anything else. Yeah. yeah. So I brought some of that up as a little segue with like Uranus going through Taurus because this lunation I feel like in Taurus, this mm. full moon that's taking place is probably going to bring to light, and there's probably going to become some clarity this month for Mm. some of the people that were starting some of those experiments, especially earlier this year around May when we had the new moon in Taurus, not long after Uranus went into Taurus for the final time. Um, Some of the experiments and some of the new changes that people made in their lives at that time or initiated in their lives back in May, you're probably going to start to see some of the results of that so that it becomes clear what the outcome of those changes were and whether that experiment was like a success or whether you have to like go back to the drawing board. Yeah, definitely. Whatever, whatever that stabilization piece is, right? Because the night before the full moon is uh, Kazemi time and moon conjunct Uranus. Uranus time. And then yeah. the next day, the next night is the full moon, right? Yeah. So there's, there's very much a like, I agree completely, Chris. There's a like, Okay, so here was what we're doing with Uranus. Here are the experiments. Here are the changes in process. And then next day, okay, like what are we going to do with this? How do we, you know, let's sit with it, which is mm-hmm. the, you know, that stabilizing. Mm-hmm. But yeah, if you've got, you know, early, early fix stuff, um, then it's going to be a review of this year's science. 
Yes, that's great. Review of this year's science. Love it. Definitely. All right. So that is the full moon that's going on right around the middle of the month. Um, are there any other major mid-month things that we need to note? We got the conjunction. I guess basically we move on to the third week or the following week at mm -hmm. this point when the other stuff starts happening, right? Yeah. I mean, the moon in Gemini is nice because it's configured to both Venus and Jupiter. Venus and Jupiter. And the moon mm -hmm. in Cancer, especially the second day of it, kind of sucks because it's configured to Saturn, Pluto, Mars, but those pass quickly. Yeah. That's like my yeah. solar return this year. Lucky you. No. Is well, it? Well, back, back no, on you're, the first, you're earlier. my, my yeah. solar turns really bad. Look at it. It's November 1st, and I get um, the moon is conjunct Saturn. It's just barely separating by minutes, but thankfully, uh, it applies directly after that to like a square with Mars in conjunction with Pluto. Oh, so that's... I got this lovely um, moon enclosed by Mars, Saturn, Pluto conjunction in the old, the old solar return chart. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, mine's. Yeah. Uh, I've had some, um, some non-advantageous solar returns, uh, the last several years in a row. One thing I would say is, thank God that solar returns are not the permanent. Well, and they're also like I. I don't know. Like uh, there were some questions about this the other day in one of my classes, and um, you know, they're useful. I would put them, you know, fourth or fifth in line. Uh, behind a lot of other timing techniques. I'll take zodiacal releasing and annual perfections and certain transits and probably natural years and Vim Shodari Dasha before I will look at solar returns. I mean, you know, and then filter what's going on in solar returns. Um, you know, it's not as important as other things. I see a lot of people freaking out about solar returns. Chris, what perfection yeah. are you going into? Yeah, that's what I wanted to know. <laughs> that's not a good. That's not leading anywhere good. I'm going to twelve. I'm going to my twelfth house perfection here. Okay. 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 Right. Okay. Right. So now we can just so segue now Chris on, is move like... into a different <laughs> conversation. Oh, Chris. So we're so we we're going to start with you. We're going to start a GoFundMe to yeah. fly Chris to a location where Jupiter will be conjunct the degree of the rising for his solar return. There right. we go. Like to Hawaii or something. Well, yeah. There's nothing wrong with going to Hawaii. I would actually have bad luck though. I'm sure it would be the Jupiter conjunct my ascendant. I would have to go to like Siberia or something and hike for 10 miles <laughs> to get into a remote location in order to have my solar return. Which would be uh, perfect for a moon conjunct Saturn. I right? was just thinking, yeah. Right. Go you you will be in the mountains. That's good. Yeah. Anyway, well at least <laughs> we'll have a lovely Venus Jupiter conjunction in my 11th house and you guys will be joining me out here in the studio for the first time. So okay, I think that's yeah, also also think about that. Like that's happening about 5 minutes after your solar return, your new birthday year begins, and that's yeah. just, you know, maybe a sign of things to come. Totally. Oh, yeah, because, you know, there's going to be that big conference next year in your backyard where all of your astrology peeps are going to fly in just to see you. Yeah, I don't know, just to see me, but they'll all be here. <laughs> they'll all we'll be here. <laughs> have a lot of fun. Uh, the yeah. early bird special actually just ended for that. I was really surprised that that's already over. They um, did a, a very taut, uh, short, tight timeline. Just what was it, like a month? Way. Basically, I think they slightly extended it for a couple of days, but then, yeah, it's done now. Okay. Well, but there'll still be other like price hikes. So it's still like if you're going to go to the conference and the earlier you buy the tickets, the better. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Third week of November. Third week. All right. Planets on the move. Chart again. Yep. Mars into Scorpio, I believe is our first order of business. Correct. First order of business. <laughs> Let's get the itinerary. What, what are those? Agenda, meeting agendas? What do they the, call them? The marching order. The marching order. Well, that's appropriate, isn't it? So there it is. So uh, what, about the 19th, Mars ingresses yes. into Scorpio and returns to its home, home sign. And is no longer on that angle to Capricorn, which yes. would be a pleasant we finally, shift. That's, that's the very tail end. That's, that's the end point of the Mars-Saturn square that's been going on for a long time up to that point. And even though 
it's separate. It's been separating from the exact square for quite some time. Um, this is when that square is finally officially over. Yay! Yes. And um, that is replaced by uh, Mars's opposition to Uranus. Yeah. Which is just that's just a little bit. You know, that's not the whole just time. Just a little something, something. But, yeah. Um, is, is this the first time we've had a Mars Uranus opposition? Or do we have that at all? During the I last round, I think we could have because you no, uh, yeah, you did it, not have it. We, we haven't had Mars and Scorpio opposite Uranus since. and Taurus for like two years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We haven't had Mars and Scorpio since Uranus has gone into Taurus. So this is a, a new one, and this is one of the things we talked about last month. That's really weird. Is just this is the first time with Uranus going through Taurus, having an outer planet change signs like that, and being in this sign for the first time in. 70 or 80 years, um, it's really changing the dynamic of some of the inner planet transits that otherwise we're used to and, and would have their own flavor on their own, like Mars going through Scorpio and returning to its home sign, but it's really getting altered and offset and um, changed in potentially dramatic ways by hitting this opposition with Uranus as it returns to its home sign. So it's not just a pure Mercury and Scorpio archetype, but it's changed significantly. So what are yeah. some possible keywords for, let's say, Mars mm -hmm. opposite Uranus or Mars opposite Uranus with Mars going through Scorpio? Well, Mars opposite Uranus gives, I guess, a, a volatile or a combustible type quality. It's going to be a different tone to that, though, because the last time we've had Mars opposite Uranus, Mars was in Libra, Uranus was in Aries, and that's a more volatile sign pairing versus the Scorpio Taurus, which is sort of the, it's like the the rumbling from deep within, if yeah. you like, and that, like it's coming up, for, it's not just on the surface, it's very much like the belly and rising up. Very deep. Yeah, yeah I agree with that. Yeah, I mean, Mars, um, any angular configuration between Mars and Uranus, um, you know, it's, uh, I don't know, one of the analogies that I've used is that you know Mars is the 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 keg of gasoline or the or the powder keg and Uranus is the the lightning strike. Mm -hmm. um, you know it's very explosive. If you can contain and direct that explosion, it can be very high energy. You know it's worth remembering that all combustion engines, you know that all our cars where most yeah. of our cars run on, those are all contained and directed explosions. Right. You know, yes. we're setting gasoline on fire and then using the contained power of that to drive really fast. Um, and so, you know, you want to, um, how should we say, uh, consider the integrity of your containment structure uh, around that, especially around uh, the, let's look like, it looks like the 24th, which Chris has just put up, where we have the, the moon conjunct yeah. Mars and opposite Uranus. Yeah. Yeah. Look at it. The moon hits those two right about the exact same time that Mars is exactly opposing Uranus on the 24th. The moon like comes up and conjoins Mars and opposes Uranus almost simultaneously. Yeah. This was the day that I didn't want to do any recording. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. This is this the was, Sunday. This, okay. This is yep. Austin's hard pass day. Yeah. This is the day after our amazing electional chart. It just goes into like a really a kind of a tense one. So, yeah. Kelly, you're doing a workshop in uh, Boulder on in this, Boulder. this day. Yeah, it's funny because I know when Austin said, let's not record something together, I was like, totally fine. And I remember thinking, that's all ninth house for me. And I know it's not perfect in terms of configuration stuff, but I often end up teaching when there's a lot of Scorpio activation just because it is ninth house. And so it has turned out that uh, I will be teaching in Boulder on that day. Thankfully, okay. a few hours after this exact thing has passed. Yeah. Because that was like have, four in the morning, right? Yeah. You yeah. have yeah. moon on Mercury. And also, I think that um, I think it's much easier to do a solo thing under any really Marsy configuration than to engage in an activity which requires cooperation. More and, collaboration. Yeah, and like space sharing and handing off back and forth and maintaining cohesion. Um, if it's just get up and do your thing, um, that's much that's that's within Mars's wheelhouse in a way that 
dialogue or trialogue isn't. Mm, that's a really good point. And I, I liked what you were saying too, Austin, about the combustion engine, that, that there's a, a lot of energy in this configuration and essentially it's what you're going to channel it into. Yeah. Well, in the, the energy though, in both cases with both Mars and Uranus, with Uranus, it's like a desire, a liberating energy or a desire to seek liberation like we were talking about earlier, whereas Mars is often a desire to separate from something. And when you put those two together and put them in a tense aspect with each other where they're at extreme opposite ends of the spectrum, um, that's why where you start getting some of the explosive and potentially like tumultuous type significations because um, those are kind of difficult energies to combine into something in a way that um, is not subjectively kind of um, unsettling when it occurs to have to like liberate or separate from something, uh, but often in a way that's um, you know difficult or or hard. Yeah, and they both have change. Yeah. Uh, as, right. uh, as what they like. You know, when, when Mars acts, it's not to keep the situation the same. No, um, and to- those are both, ex- those are, I would say, undoubtedly the two most impatient planets. Yeah. It's not like slow change. Like Saturn can sometimes be like slow, laborious, like building one stone each, you know, month in order to build like a temple over the course of a 30 year period. Like Mars <laughs> and Uranus are both really rapid, really sudden, and really impatient changes. And sometimes that impatient can lead to an impulsive action that leads to the separation or the liberation. But in the process, there's somebody usually involved in that process that's not having a good day when that takes place. Yeah. Yeah. And it may yeah. not be you. You may you may be the one that's suddenly having this desire to cut and separate and sever yourself from things unexpectedly. Uh, but the person on the other end of that might experience that subjectively negatively. On the other hand, you might be the one that experiences a sudden separation or disruption of something uh, that could be experienced as unpleasant, even if in some instances it becomes necessary or constructive in the long term. Yeah, absolutely, definitely. And I think that that you know it's always useful to think about. Um, any configuration, both from what if it's me versus what if it's somebody I'm relating to. But I think that that becomes um, all the more vital and important when we're dealing with Mars and Uranus, especially, you know, where, where we've got um, dramatic big action. We were talking about that uh, earlier. You know, Chris, mm. you brought that up earlier with Uranus. Like, it's a big difference between the person who's going into the wild versus the person who is left behind. Yeah. Right. Whereas like if it's like Saturn and a person is slowly stacking bricks, uh, you're like, yep, you know, Susie gonna be is, here for a while. Yep. She's slowly stacking bricks. It's not a big deal. Um, yeah, you, you know. got some adjustment time of like 30 years to get used to that. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> versus like the person who just, wakes up one day and says, you know, I don't want to be in this situation anymore and I'm leaving this afternoon. Yep, and I'm taking yeah. the cat. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to get a new cat, by the way. An extra one? Yeah, an extra uh yeah, in case ours wears out. Is this an actual <laughs> cat or are you talking about a metaphorical cat? No, I think no, he's no. being serious now. No, this is it's oh, a he's... literal it's a literal cat. Literal um, cat. <laughs> we've been on a waiting list for a Maine Coon kitten for like <gasps> 10 months. Oh. And we found out that we get our pick of the next couple litters. And so I want a giant silver kitten because we have a, a kitten. You know how much hair already. you're going to have with a Maine Coon? Um, probably not as much as from my current cat. I mean, I know your current cat's quite big, but aren't Maine oh, Coons he, like he's, long hair? He's, he's the sheddiest. Okay. But okay, so well, the this point- is- yeah, tell us the, more about so the this. Plan, is gonna be very exciting. The plan is to get a so Maine Coons are very large. Yes. Um, so he's getting old. Our current cat, he's about twelve right now, and so the plan is to get him a kitten so he has somebody to care for and keep him young. And then by the time he's super old, the kitten will be gigantic, and he will be like a kitten to what was formerly the kitten, and he will be cared for and have his head licked in his old age. Oh, 
That's beautiful. So I don't Nick, know why the Scorpio Mars Uranus conjunction made you I think no of that, idea. but I'm very excited that you're getting another cat. Yeah, I that was a complete non sequitur. We will have to check in again on this next month for Cat Watch 2019. Yes, uh, to get an update. Uh, I, that I'm, transit. I'm I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure Kate will um uh will let the gram know if let if the, and let when the we world get know. the yeah we okay. get the uh the kitten. So, okay, I mean, sorry, Chris. Back to this. Just it's we didn't mention though that Mercury is stationing direct pretty much simultaneously. So all this stuff we're talking about of sudden, decisive, possibly unexpected, possibly disruptive action needing to take place and perhaps taking place at the Mars Uranus opposition around the twenty third, twenty fourth, when the Moon especially comes in and activates that. We have Mercury stationing direct at the same time, so it's almost like there's some deliberative act that had been taking place for three weeks up to that point, and then all of a sudden Mercury sort of stations direct and like the action that has to take place, you know, becomes clear at that point. So yeah, for some the, people this may have been something you're like stewing on for a while during the course of the Mercury retrograde and then it, it happens and everything becomes clear around the twenty third and twenty fourth. Yeah, that yeah. um that nineteenth through the twenty fourth, a lot of things Happen. Click in, yeah. Th there's a shift into drive there, and so I, I feel like we should talk about Mars and Scorpio outside of the the Uranus pace. Yeah, because uh, Mars and Scorpio is great, um, and so yes. here's the connection between cats and Mars and Scorpio. Both, <laughs> okay. both, both, both are vicious killers. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's true. Cats' hunting instinct is phenomenally deeply ingrained. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I like so vicious I, killers. Tell us about that, Austin. Well, so um, you probably shouldn't be killing people or animals, um, right? But um, there is that you know Mars and Scorpio brings that killer instinct, um, and that's the you know that's the same energy and mindset that uh, that's required to bring things to completion to get it done. Right to to it, to scratch off. Eh, it's not your, you know, your to do list and your hit list. Right, you just you get it done, 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 done. done. Um, it's like it's that, that. Yeah. Go ahead. I was gonna say it's like that writer um, adage. You know, kill your little darlings, where you're you've got to kill off some of what you're doing so that you can get to the quality of what you're doing. Um, and I, have you heard that phrase? That writer phrase, kill your oh, little sure. darlings. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, Mars and Scorpio has this very almost obsessive single-mindedness. Yeah, it's really, uh, you know, so it's the, Mars has two domiciles, right? There's Aries and Scorpio. And, you know, Aries is the bright, bombastic, um, you know, well-lit, visible, um, uh, initiatory side of Mars. And then Scorpio is the, is fixed and it's water, right? So it's, it's pressurized um, and emotionally fixated in a way that can be very helpful, right? Think of uh, steam engines, right, or hydraulics. Um, you know, it's the the that emotional energy fixed on getting it done, fixed mm. on getting through, fixed on whatever. Um, and it's very, it's it can be a very productive, uh, very influence. productive. Um, yeah, it's like having blinkers on and just keep. Keeping on with whatever is in front of you and just consistent effort tackles the to-do list or slays it, as you're saying. Yeah, yeah, I've yeah. Said, I've said this a million times in the podcast, but the Zoller always had a saying that Mars in Aries is like a machine gun and that Mars in Scorpio is like a snipe, sniper rifle. And that was his analogy for the difference between Aries energy versus Scorpio energy. Mm, yeah, I've always gone with uh, Samurai and Ninja. Um, okay. Yeah. But I... But I was like, yeah, are, this is ninja energy. Yeah, just you know, moving silently through the night, um, but steadily, like penetrating the defenses, accomplishing your, you know, whatever your your motive is, moving on. Ooh, ninja November, I like that oh, from the comments. There we go. Nate Hashtag. Leonard. Yeah. I was thinking about names for this Mercury retrograde. That the the spooky grade got me thinking. And mm -hmm. I, I couldn't come up with anything. If Mars was co-present with Mercury when it was retrograde, oh, I think we could have gone with retroblade. 
But, oh, that would have been brilliant. But it's not co-present, so I feel like that's off limits. Yeah, Mars that's is over doable. in Libra most of the time. Um, Chris, just to add to what you were saying before around Mercury being direct as this Mars-Uranus stuff is happening and the moon's there, the moon, of course, is going to pass over Mercury for the first time since it's station direct. So I always find that tends to pick up some of the stuckness of the Mercury retrograde, like the hangover, and just helps clear that forward or get things moving. Right. Yeah. And then yeah, we've that's got a, a good point. Yeah, and then we've got a, a new moon day and a half later. So there's a big reset, um, like 19th through 25th, 26th. That's like, uh, you know, we get Mars moving in. We get the Uranus opposition to Mars. We get Mercury direct, and then we get the new, and then the Sun ingresses, and then we get the new Moon um, over, you know, over less than a week. Um, it's a busy time. The Venus. Well, I, actually, I, I yeah. don't. I don't think it's gonna. Uh, I'm sorry to argue here, but I no, it, no. It's it's the last couple days of the lunar cycle. It's actually. I don't think it's gonna be busy. It's gonna be all the stuff clicking into place. Um, I mean, maybe uh, it's going to be the stuff clicking into place to then do the next cycle. Um, yeah, I thought about that balsamic moon when you guys were talking about the moon Mars Uranus combo and that idea of the cutting and the clearing, just like, you know, need to release, need to let go or need to get it done. You know, that closure mm -hmm. completion thing. I just wanted to also throw in the Venus Jupiter conjunction is happening basically within the same 24 hour period as the Mars Uranus. So that's a great point. Yeah. There is. Weird it's contrast. a weird contrast, yeah, of energies there. The Mars Uranus obviously has the moon on side, but um, Venus Jupiter is happening there in Sag uh, in that same period. Um, and slightly related, but I was thinking earlier today, I saw somebody talking about um, Mercury and Scorpio and how they communicate or how Mercury and Scorpio communicates with the premise being that Mercury represents communication. And they said something about silence, which makes me think of Austin's ninja analogy and the idea of uh, like assassins moving in silence, but Mercury in Scorpio is not always just silence, but it can also just be, if you were to describe like a mode of communication, it would be like whispering, or um, you know, what is the related like term of like whispering, but also passing something or a message um, secretly and subtly versus like Mars, encode? yeah, like encoded versus Mars Ooh. in um, Aries. Which is much more overt, or overt and like <laughs> with a megaphone. <laughs> yeah, with a megaphone versus like passing a secret message or like a note. Yeah, but, absolutely. Uh, it uh, makes me think of like those spy drops, as, you know, where you would have to like mm -hmm. leave it in the park bench at certain time under the newspaper, and someone else is going to come by and pick it up and hope they know your code. Or maybe I've watched too many like 1950s spy movies or something. Yeah, it, it's right. the it's the secret handshake. Yes. Sylvie in the text, the chat says everybody use Signal and WhatsApp. And that actually reminds me, there's like a few years back when, um, what was it? It was like Saturn. It was a Saturn and Scorpio transit. There's like a Mercury retrograde in Scorpio. And like the head of the CIA at the time got caught. Um, remember that? He was like having an affair or something. And they were passing secret messages through Gmail <gasps> drafts or something oh, like that. Yes. They, that that's was, right. They were putting emails in the draft folder and they could both log in and then delete them or something. Right. Which is funny because it sounded like the least um, covert High -tech. <laughs> uh, for like the head of the CIA to be doing. That was, but, yeah, he was a, he was a former general in the uh, yes. Iraq campaign. What was that guy's name? Oh, Petraeus. Yeah, Petraeus. Petraeus. Yeah. I remember yeah. he had Saturn in Libra and that's all. And Mars in Capricorn. <laughs> okay. I just remembered I thought as the Saturn and Scorpio thing, but anyway, so with Mercury going retrograde in Scorpio in November, we might see some of that stuff. Um, well, because Mercury, the water signs are mute. So mm -hmm. that idea of the non-spoken message is definitely Mercury and Scorpio. Mm -hmm. Yes. The, the right. wink, the handshake. Yeah. The feeling, the touch. The, yeah. The... Um... Yeah, the, right. the message in the song or whatever. Yeah. 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 All right. So, okay. um, Mercury so stations direct, the Venus Jupiter conjunction, and then um, eventually then things start. Cap. Yeah. So, Venus changes signs and moves into Capricorn by November 26th. 
25th, it's looking 25th, like? 25th, yeah, and then the new moon on the 26th in Sag. Okay, four degrees of Sagittarius, new moon in, Sag in Sagittarius, great. So that's another shift that's taking place. So right after all of that stuff, then basically we get some major shifts happening with that lunation and with Venus changing signs. Yeah, yeah. And so, the, and then what we have, uh, what, the chart that we have during that new moon is what we're going to have for a while, except for the Jupiter's going to move into cap a week yeah. after this. But that Mercury and Scorpio, Mars and Scorpio, Venus and Cap, we're going to have for several weeks after um, uh, after this new moon. So this new moon, you know, sets it up differently. It's definitely that sobering end of year kind of qualitative change in the sky that we've kind of been hinting at and, and sort of um, previewing up until this point. That yeah, once Venus goes into Cap, I think she's then starting a trend. Of course, Jupiter's going to follow. And then we're like back down to ground. Earth, it's this, the word I keep getting is sobering. Like the reality sets in, the party's over, the cleanup, or now you've made all these big promises and plans with Venus and Jupiter and Sag, and now you have to deliver or follow through. Oh, right. I want to- The, the I, work has to be done. Yeah. Okay. So I want to make one point. I noticed something fun. So if we look at American Thanksgiving, which is- I was going to say, we should look at that chart, right? It's Thursday well, the 28th. Right. And so it's literally the moon's, it's the last conjunction- oh, it is. Of the moon uh, and in Jupiter Sag. and Sag. Yeah. Uh, and it's, you know, when it's on a Thursday. Yeah. Um, and so it's really, uh, it's really a pretty beautiful Thanksgiving chart. Like the last hurrah of Jupiter and Sag with the moon there. Yeah, because Jupiter's gone in less than a week. Or not gone, but gone to cap. <laughs> right. It moves in on the second already, it looks like. Yeah, so second or third. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's very fast. The very beginning of December, that's going to be all Capricorn all the time. So this is interesting, though. This last week of November, we get Venus with Jupiter and Sag, then we get the moon with Jupiter and Sag, and that's it for Jupiter and Sag. Yep. Yeah. Like, it's, it's literally going out with a bang. Yeah, this is the last of it. So that's another good reason to take advantage of that election, election. chart because that's like the last major Jupiter and Sag election or that that and, you know, maybe one or two others later in the month before you can't use that again for 11, 12 years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there'll I mean, be the Jupiter and Pisces in a couple of years, but um, you know, you can't you can't just stick Jupiter in the 10th or the 1st um in 2020 at all. Because then no. you're you're also sticking Saturn and Pluto and for half of the year the South Node uh, in the first or tenth, and it's not you know the juice isn't worth the squeeze there. Well, no, yeah. and then in the other half of the year you've got Mars at an angle to that, which is excellent point. Something oh, else yeah. for the retrograde <laughs> Mars retrograde yeah. in Aries. Yeah, well, more, yeah more, Mars is more, it's more there for fun. six months. All right, oh yeah, all right, let's it's actually that it's actually like yes, that's eight, coming up next time. Right, it's actually closer to nine months. All right. Well, because it's early 2021 as well. Yeah, we are getting way ahead of ourselves. <laughs> Maybe so eight months. Excited. I don't know. You guys are literally flying all the way out here to talk about that. So let's not jump so the gun. We're, we're very well prepared, Chris. We're very enthusiastic and excited. Um, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer for Thanksgiving, but <laughs> I'm going to add something that's, you know, when people say, I don't want to be this thing and you're like, you know, right. exactly they're going to be that thing. The moon is with Sag, but I think it's quite early in the morning. With, is, with, is with Jupiter and Sag, but I think it's quite early in the morning because later in the day it does go into Cap. Well, let's let's look at it. Chris, okay. will you show us so, on the screen, please? Thursday, 11 a.m. Oh, yeah, it does go in really early, right? Yeah. So at least there's the Venus conjunction, actually, but then we're on to the south node. So I mean, the Venus eating goes on all day, right? Yeah, I mean, okay. it is basically Moon separating from Venus and applying to sextile Mars in Scorpio, and then eventually after that, later in the evening, starts applying to conjunction with Saturn, and the sun will set because the sun's setting earlier at that point in the year, so later, later on that day, it's actually more Moon-Saturn applying than anything. Yeah, I so think it'll just be interesting so to see how the mood breakfast. changes. Have a big breakfast, do the family thing in the morning, maybe. Or or live on the East Coast. Yeah. Oh, and of course, yeah. 
some commentary about the drinks kicking in later in the day from Kate and uh, the truth comes out. Yeah, there was, I don't know. Uh, I do think it's fun to look at the astrology of those big celebrations just to see, you know, how things, what the mood might be, basically. Yeah. Um, and it's not connected almost with anything, especially, but Neptune is also stationing direct basically at the same time. Oh, yeah, that's on the 27th. So Neptune stationing direct at 15 degrees of Pisces. With Mercury in a little trine to it. Yeah. So I don't know. That's not huge, not that significant. I'm not sure what to say about that since this is like a decade-long transit that we've already been dealing with for a while. Yeah. I mean, that moon Jupiter does look really nice. Well, and that's when – that's building on the Wednesday night, which is when everyone's often traveling too, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Most yeah. people are going to be where they, um, uh, they, they're going to be where they're going to wake up on Thursday morning on Wednesday night. Wednesday so, night. Yeah. So yeah, maybe it's the, yeah, maybe it's the, the, the Eve Thanksgiving Eve, um, that's going to be truly glorious. Sure. So that pretty much brings us to the end of November then, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, any last thoughts or final words about the astrology of November before we hang out and chat about some other astrological topics in the second part of the show? So what was the ninja reference? I want that hashtag again. Austin, what did you say? Oh, uh, someone in the comments. I'm sorry, I can't remember your name yeah, right now. It was now. Nate. Uh, yeah. Oh, Nate Ninja said, November. Uh, ninja November. Ninja November. Why does it's- November get so many nicknames? Like... There's like like Movember, I think, where people grow yep. mustaches. There's like, isn't there like a like try to write a novel in a yes. month thing? Yes, N- no, national novel writing in a month. Then then there's a, an acronym for that that I can't remember right now. Is in uh, there's also last year wasn't there a thing that was like no fap November where a number of men swore off masturbating for the month for Scorpio month? I did not hear that. I'm wow. I'll, I'll send you some links, <laughs> um, but like, but like, why? It's funny. But why that no- would they do that? I, I, yeah. But um, but November. Well, probably because they were doing it too much. Um, okay. But um, but yeah, like you don't have that with June. No. You know, like, like no. nobody's like got like ten different things. Yeah, no nut November. That's it. <laughs> um, sorry. Thank you, Christina. Um, but like you know, people don't do that with May. No. Right? Like there are like 10 different protocols that people get into. Um, this, that's, this is really funny because this is about to be our segue into our sponsor segment again. I told you I had some more for you, Chris. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, gosh. That's so funny. Give me another topic so that we can have a different segue. Anything? Well, I was trying to summarize the November stuff. Like the please, truth Please theory, go on. Mercury and Scorpio, the kill your little darlings with Mars and Scorpio. Enjoy some good times. Go for the excitement. Venus with Jupiter and Sag. I never have the fun alliterations. Uh, yeah. yeah. I don't do know why November. Keyword or a title for this episode. Yeah. Um, if anybody wants to throw out any short, concise titles in the chat, let us know. Uh, there is something though. I, I mean, as soon as you said that, Austin, like, why does November have all these things? I was thinking about the Halloween All Saints Day at the end of October, start of November. Um, the one November has all these things. It, it's it, historically, it's such a pivotal time in a number of different cultures and religions to think about transition. And in some ideas, it's actually the start of the year rather than, I mean, you know, in the kind of non-religious world, we celebrate New Year's on the 1st of January, but in most religious or spiritual traditions, New Year's happens at some other slightly more relevant or energetically significant period in time. How dare you call Christ's birthday insignificant? When did I do that? Well, that's what our that's what our calendar is anchored to. But I think you're totally right. No, no. Do you mean because of the Christian Christmas thing? Yeah. In the Catholic faith, Christmas is not the most important celebration. Easter is. Well, I know that, but That's a good point. I think you're ignoring our Lord's birthday. Um, well, but, but anyway, even- <laughs> I, I want to go back to the point, to your okay, earlier point. Okay, go back to what you want to be. <laughs> um, which is that, um, yeah, I think that's a really good point about November is that in the Northern Hemisphere, um, yes. 
where the overwhelming majority of the human People population have always lives. Lived. Um, it's a time of transition and death. Um, mm. And so letting go of something, um, yeah. making a transition or like, you know what, I'm going to start doing this now and I'm going to stop doing this now makes a lot of sense. And uh, as I think some, I think I saw a comment flash um, that it's, um, uh, you know, that Scorpio energy is good for obsession, right? Yes. Good for obsession. Like I'm definitely doing this or I'm definitely not doing that. Um, whereas like, I don't know, you know, uh, Gemini energy in June is not so good for uh, <laughs> fix, fixating on a particular task. Uh-uh. No way, right. Jose. So, so the attempt to make sustained efforts to make changes in one's life, um, although in this instance with the Mars Uranus opposition sort of starting it off, it might be something that still uh, proceeds from like a decisive action or a sudden impulse to want to make a major change. Yeah. Well, I think with it with Mercury being retrograde for so much of the month, people may um uh experience more vacillation uh in their uh you know, uh in whatever their uh, uh pledges are. You might want to delay whatever um oaths you're going to take until Mercury's direct and Mars is in Scorpio. Yeah, later in the Ooh, month. Somebody somebody suggested retrovember. Retro yeah, yeah, nice like one, Ashlyn. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Well, that might be the forecast for November. So this experiment was interesting because we did an hour and a half forecast. So now in our usual two-hour episode, we would have about 30 minutes to talk about stuff. Uh, we do have to usually, since it's the midway point and the transition point, we usually that's when we throw in uh, talking about the news and what we have going on. Do you guys have anything you wanted to mention that you have coming up this month or that you're, you're launching any classes or anything like that? I'll mention my workshop in Boulder, which is Sunday, November 24th, if you feel like braving Mars Uranus but enjoying Venus Jupiter. Uh, I'm <laughs> teaching a full day training on aspects in Boulder and the sign up info, it's on the event page on my website, but it's also on the Astrology University website. Uh, So if anybody's interested in that, I also recently taught a webinar on the rulers of the houses. It's a bit of a beginner look at how we do that in traditional astrology, just using very simple, the planet on the sign on the cusp of the house. And that webinar is now um, for sale on my website. That's it for me. What about you, Austin? Well, I'll be hard at work uh, finishing up the second edition of 36 Faces and the Aldebaran series, which I elected earlier this year, will be released through Sphere and Sundry. Ah, oh, I did see hints of this on social media. I'm very excited for that. It's good. It's one of the four royals. It's it, um, yes, yes, it is. It's an abundant red energy, but it's it's not um, it's not Mars. Um, it's interesting. No, yeah, it's uh, it's the 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 fire of the builder. I would say. I quite like that one. Aldebaran? Yeah. Yeah, we sort of accidentally ended up with it in our, well, not accidentally, but it's in our wedding chart. Oh, it's good. You will own yeah. many productive mines and agricultural fields together. <laughs> Fantastic. Own, not saying that like own mines, but given that my husband and I both have jobs in education, that's probably somewhat relevant. So child labor, I thought- <laughs> I thought better of you, Kelly. I don't know how you got to child labor from that. Well, you're the one who was like, mines, oh, we've got kids. Got a, a kids. Army, I... army of children. No, I meant like just sharing ideas. Oh. You know, in the nice way. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and when I say like accidentally, you know, obviously unless you're going to relocate your wedding to like five years later because we just happened to get married the year that Jupiter was on Aldebaran. Beautiful. Mm, nice. So we, we put the moon applying to Jupiter for that. Yeah, that's awesome. So I'm excited for you guys to give us some juicy stuff and for people to learn more about the royal stars. I mean, it's a great way to get people into the fixed stars. Yeah, they're good ones. They're good ones. So when's that coming out? Do you have a launch date or is that uh, to be decided? Uh, I think Kate is launching on November 14th. 
I could be wrong, but I believe nice. that's the case. Oh, yeah, because the moon will be there then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. Yes, confirmed 14th. 14th, 2.30 p.m. Pacific, I'm guessing. Yes, PDT. Love it. Or maybe cool. it's just And then PT. you guys will be coming out here for a week. Uh, in mm-hmm. November, we're still trying to figure out how we can um, live stream that because usually we live stream the forecast episodes, but we're going to be here in person. So I'm going to be scrambling over the next few weeks to figure that out and figure out how to be able to bring our live audience in as usual of patrons who always join us for these episodes. There's almost, I think there's 75 people that have been joining us here for this one today, which yeah, is awesome. Yeah, this has been great. Yeah. Um, let's see what else. I'm trying to decide if we're going to do posters this year. We are finalizing the designs for them, but it's kind of a logistical nightmare getting those out each year, and it may be a little late to get them on Amazon. So um, if anybody has any ideas about poster fulfillment and figuring out how to work out a system for getting those out still, let me know. Um, Lisa and I are also going to work on our electional report for the entire year ahead because that went so well last year that we're going to do it again this year where we pick out one electional chart for each month Mm. and then sort of launch that as a sort of um, video and audio podcast and written report that you can purchase for a reasonable price. And uh, let's see, the only other thing is um, our sponsor again this month is the Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanac. And uh, it seems like a ton of people actually got this last month after mentioning on last month's episode. I know, Kelly, you ordered one, and Austin, you have one on the way. Indeed. Yeah, I haven't got mine yet, but I'm very excited. Yeah, so I just wanted to show a little bit more of the features, because I mentioned it. This is a PDF, actually, of mine. So it comes with your like sun, moon, and rising on the cover. And what's weird about it, or what's cool about it, is it's completely personally customized to your birth date and time and location, which is unique compared to most things. Because usually it's like you buy you know, one of those planners and it's just set to like Eastern time or Pacific time or whatever, and that's it. But this is not just mundane transits. These are actually transits customized to your actual birth chart. So um, one of the things, go ahead. I was just going to say, honestly, it's like they've they've obviously created the right technology to do this. And this is something that I've just thought should be out there for such a long time. And I'm so glad they've done such a great job with the quality of it. Yeah, and I actually genuinely don't know how what, how they're doing that to do a reasonably priced print on demand thing that's customized to each person because you can choose like your zodiac, your house system, and a bunch of other customized stuff. Um, then one of the cool things is that it's put together by an astrologer and professional graphic designer, and there's a lot of interesting design decisions that they came up with. Um, so you have a copy of your chart that's at the beginning, and there's this cool little chord diagram that shows up at the bottom of page five, where it shows what degrees and the sort of pro- progression of degrees of all of your planetary placements, so you know which ones are going to get hit earlier versus which ones are going to get hit later. So I have Pluto at like two degrees of Scorpio, so usually that's one of the first planets that gets activated when aspects go over like two degrees. Um, my midheavens at five, Sagittarius, Chiron, Jupiter around nine, ten, Scorpio. So there's just cool little design things like that that show things and make things easier, especially for students of astrology. Um, one of the things I've been working with the most though is the visual design that they have for displaying what transits are happening. And at the beginning of the booklet, they have this long-term sort of transit calendar that shows you. Um, which transits are going to be going exact and which planets are applying or separating uh, during different months. So uh, let's see, the orange um, indicates the the planet is retrograde, uh, the black indicates that it's applying, and then a, a vertical little tick line indicates the exact date that the transit goes exact. So that's something kind of useful for people like us that are following long-term mm-hmm. outer planet transits. Um, mm. It's going to make a great gift idea, you know, coming into the holidays. Yeah. Uh, if you, let's if you do gifts. So it does the long term one, but then it also has a calendar that shows you when the transits go exact and the exact time set to your 
location so you can pick what city you set it to so it's not just showing it for some random time zone that's like you have to do conversions for but it actually tells you when it goes exact in your current city uh, as well as um, let's see shorter term interplanet transits once you go to individual months so at the beginning it gives you long-term transits but then when you go to the monthly breakdown it shows you the interplanet transits that are much quicker and go exact and often unless the planet goes retrograde it's just a one-time hit versus the outer planet transits that are more sort of long-term cycles and then finally the favorite part that i know you're going to love kelly is the ephemeris the personalized ephemeris that is at the end of the booklet and this is really cool because it gives you again it's just an ephemeris but it gives you the time zone set for your actual city and location so i have mm. this set for denver so it tells you exactly when the planets are making those stations or changing signs based on your actual uh, city and location. I think that's amazing because that just takes out the need to convert. And like, I know it's here because obviously the standard, these types of ephemerises are just to midnight in Greenwich. So you do have to kind of mentally adjust. Right. I know there's some comments going on about how people thought it would be really expensive based on how detailed and the quality, but it is, they've done it in such an affordable way it's quite amazing. Yeah. Oh, look at um, that. The full moon and the new moon. Mason with the in left the chat hand. says yeah. when they thought I introduced it last month, they thought it would be like $130, but it's not. It's like 20, 20 bucks. Yeah, like 35 or something. It's yeah. really impressive. Six or two. It's very, isn't it? It's phenomenal. Uh, I'm very excited about the ephemeris part. The yeah, whole I thing, just that it's got your own transits, like it's your diary and it says today the moon is doing something to your Mars or Mars is doing something to your Venus or whatever. It's fantastic. Yeah, so could... I think you're going to like that the most. Um, so this is the uh, Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs and you can find out more information or you can order one at honeycomb.co and we'll have some links to it and other stuff. They, I think they're going to be producing some videos this month to show people how to use it since there's a lot of people that have it now and want to make sure that they like fully know how to get the most out of it. It's yeah, fantastic. That's, yeah, that's a, that's a remarkable value. Mm. And I think it's going to be a really great teaching tool for people who are learning astrology because what better than having or something that's telling you this is what is happening in your chart this day or this week, and then you can start to correlate how your chart responds. You know, always we always say to students, follow some of those personal planet transits so you can understand what something in your tenth house means. If you know what Mars there means or how that stirs things up or what have you, you'll have a better idea of what's going to happen when Jupiter or Saturn's there. And uh, it's just giving people information that it's going to help them learn. It's great. Anyway, exciting stuff. Uh, check it out. Thanks to our Gorgeous. sponsors. They're, they're going to help us sponsor uh, covering part of you guys' room and board next month when we fly you out to Denver and you guys are going to have your own house, uh, like a block over to uh, sleep in and hang out in next month when you're in Denver. Yeah. Yeah. Chris yeah. bought Maybe. us a house. Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> We're never allowed to leave. Podcasts, you know, will be coming out. <laughs> We'll see how it goes. <laughs> no, it'll be great. It's good. I'm well, he bought us the basement of a house. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. All right. Um, so um, yeah. I think that's it for news and announcements. Uh, other than that, let's talk about just some topics. So usually we do the topics at the beginning, but let's maybe do it now. Um, one of them is a follow-up to last month's discussion about the term detriment. I think I realized this after the fact, but I realized at one point early in October the term, I was looking something up and realized that the term antithesis is actually almost a perfect translation of the original Greek term for that was originally used to refer to a planet in its detriment. And I'm really kicking myself because I have this whole like extended discussion about trying to come up with a translation of the Greek term. And there was just like two that kind of conveyed different parts of it. One of them was um, exile, a planet being in its exile because it's the sign that's literally the furthest away from its home sign as you can get because it's opposite to the, the planet's domicile. Um, and the other translation was from a, a Latin translation that one of the translators used, which is adversity, which describes another part of the 
original concept underlying detriment is the idea that the planet being in the sign of its adversity. But I realized this month that actually the term antithesis is really close to the original Greek word, and I'd been searching for a better translation for a while, and I think that's actually it. Um, what do you guys think of the, about that as a term for a planet being in the sign opposite to its domicile, being in the sign of its antithesis? And part of the reason that it's that its antithesis is because obviously that sign opposite to it is ruled by a planet that has opposing or contrary or antithetical significations. So, you know, um, we were talking about Scorpio a lot, which is ruled by Mars traditionally, and that's opposite to Taurus, which is ruled by Venus. And Venus and Mars both have very antithetical significations of like, you know, peace versus war, love versus hate, fighting versus friendship, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean, part of the definition of antithesis has that idea of something that is opposite to something or someone else. So that kind of represents the quality of a planet being opposite somewhere it would prefer to be. Yeah, so the Google definition says a person or thing that is the direct opposite of someone or something else, a contrast or opposition between two things, a figure of speech in which an opposition or contrast of ideas expressed by parallelism, parallelism of words that are the opposites of or strongly contrast with each other, such as hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. Isn't that isn't that good? Like I'm really. I think it's yeah. perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I I um I believe I I, I shared it. I reshared it on Twitter, and I just said perfect because it's yeah. perfect. It's the yeah. antithesis. You know the the planet in the sign is the thesis, right? Mars and Scorpio yes. is like, well, how about we fight some stuff, and then you know the the antithesis, the counter statement in the dialogue is, well, you know, fighting stuff breaks things, and we and it's important to not break your things, and so the dialogue begins. I mean, it, it's it's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um... Yeah, I think it's something to think about, and it's also not as like doom and gloom as detriment mm. or even adversity, which I liked because it was slightly less negative in its implications. And even though there, it still carries the conveys the idea that there's some sort of challenge that comes up, but understanding, I think it gets more to the root conceptually of what the actual challenge is when a planet is in the sign opposite to its domicile. Which is that it's struggling to function in an environment and in surroundings that are um, literally the opposite of what it's most used to, or or what it's most accustomed to. Yeah, or that um, quite literally uh, attempt to invalidate its thesis or negate its thesis. Yeah. And then you know the the nature of that challenge, if we're looking at the way the term is used in like a uh, dialogue, right? Is there's the thesis, which is the, how about this? There's the antithesis, which is the, well, how about the, you know, how here's the counter statement. How about not that? And then dialogue is supposed to move on to a synthesis, right? Mm. Which includes both state, the includes what is true about both statements and a third statement, which is, you know, kind of what you need to do if you have a planet um, in its antithesis or detriment or exile, Right. If you have Mars in Libra, you have to figure out a way to Mars that includes the Venusian priorities mm. of uh, of Libra. So I think I think it's just structurally correct. Right, and it doesn't mean that you can't or that the planet can't be functional in those surroundings. It just means that it's not being given uh, significations to work with that come naturally or easy to it, and that it has to learn how to deal with. And still make the best of that which is opposite, the opposite of what it's it's used to. Yeah, it's having to do something, and it, it it's almost having to do something in a way where you have to get a bit creative or innovative because you have to do your job, but without your usual tools. And I mean, the word that the concept. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that show MacGyver that used to be on years oh, yeah, ago. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you we and it sort of became a bit of a slang. I don't know whether it was just in my family or social group. It was like. You know, you just have to MacGyver it. You just have to kind of make it up with what you've got and figure it out, even though you don't have, you know, the things that you would ideally like to have. Right. So you have having a planet is debt in detriment is like you're you're stuck in a bank vault and you have to get out using like an avocado, a snorkel, and like 
uh, like bananas, <laughs> right? Like a toothpick. Yeah, that's exactly it. And then you have to think incredibly, you know, out of your normal pattern, and you may or may not be capable of doing that. Basically. Yeah, or at least it's going to take a, a long time sometimes before you might, maybe it's something that you start off and you're more uncomfortable with early in life, but sometimes later on you develop um, ways to use that create creatively in the way that's still effective um, in accomplishing things. Well, yeah, you have to take on an unorthodox approach that's to, the word that, I was looking for. to that planet's action yeah, in order for and it to I be effective. For, and it does come down then to the ruler of the planet that is in detriment, exile, or antithesis, whether there is getting that help or support or whether it's just going to take a long time for you to be unorthodox about it. Yeah, because I think that makes a huge difference in all cases I've seen, I think is the missing thing when people sometimes try to judge this concept. Like I, I notice sometimes like modern astrologers will try to reject the idea of planets having dignity or debility in certain signs by pointing to examples where you know, certain people have that planet in a supposedly debilitated sign, but do fine. But oftentimes, in those instances, like the planet will have reception with its domicile lord, and those will be the people who have the planet in, let, let's say, detriment, but still are able to find an effective or a perfectly useful way to manifest that placement that works out well for them, even though it's unique or sort of different than how the planet might otherwise manifest naturally. Yeah. Well, and um, it's. You can't, uh, how should we say, uh, most of those critiques betray a complete lack of understanding of how essential dignity is supposed to work. Um, if you're doing essential dignity right, it's not that somebody with Mars and Aries is always super good at all of the Mars things. If it is in the 12th and if it's, you know, da 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 da, that's not what it means. Um, mm. But um, you do, I, I think I actually have an example right now. I'm just looking it up. Um, of if there's support and that is an area of life that a person bothers to spend the energy necessary um, to figure out how to excel. Because sometimes we have like planets that aren't in great positions, but those planetary spheres are not something that we care about a lot. Like, let's say you've got a, you know, you've got a great Mercury and Venus is not so good. But you Mercury for a living, like, you know, then Venus yeah. is only relevant in certain areas, right? Whereas, you know, if you Mercury for a living, if that's what you want to do, and there are some challenges to Mercury, Mercury's in an antithetical sign, then you're going to spend the time, you know, to bother. Um, you're going to spend the time and bother to figuring out your own way of doing things mm. uh, or an unusual way of doing things. So... Um, yeah, I was just going to say, uh, I was going to use Muhammad Ali as an example, who's a very, yep. you know, a, a, one of the most well-known boxers in existence who had uh, Mars in Capricorn, or excuse me, Mars in Taurus, um, which is the sign of its antithesis. And so worth noting that the ruler Venus was angular mm -hmm. um, in the chart, right, in the seventh. Um, and with the moon and Mercury. So the ruler is very strong and can see Mars. So there's support there. And then it's a Venus ruled Mars. Have you ever seen Ali fight relative to everybody else in his era? He's pretty. He's dancing. Yeah. He's like, you know, there's a focus on grace and fluidity um, that literally no one else in his era uh, displayed. It's a Venus ruled Mars, right? Mm. Um, and if you come into a slugging match with the idea, with your first priority of I'm going to be pretty, then you're probably going to lose. But that's antithetical to the, you know, like the priority there, which is to beat and not be beaten. But um, with enough support, time, energy, et cetera, you see that raise to a higher level, right? You see the the Venusian quality of that reconciled with the martial priorities. Like that's the synthesis. And I love that the an, an antithesis begs for a synthesis. So I really like that. Definitely. Do you have any like planet and detriment examples that come to mind, Kelly? I mean, the one that pops into my mind right away is Brené Brown, who has Mercury and Sag. It's first house Sag because she has a Sag rising. So she has a Virgo MC. Um, Mercury is in detriment 
obviously, but it's in its own terms in Sag, which I also think can help a planet that's in detriment. And Jupiter, its ruler, makes a sign-based opposition. Jupiter is also um, in detriment in that chart in Gemini. And Mercury does make an exact degree-based aspect to the MC, if I'm remembering this correctly. And what she does, she's known as this very thorough researcher um, in the She's got a master of social work. She's a professor, I think, at university in Texas. Is that down there? Maybe I'm not exactly sure which one, but I know she's from Texas. And she basically, a lot of her research is about our faulty thinking and our faulty thought patterns and how when we assume things that are not true to be true, how that interferes with our relationships and our success and our happiness in life. So she's using, if you like, the detriment placement to look at what goes wrong with thinking patterns. And she's applied some of the mercury things like research and what have you um, in a very successful way. I mean, she has a Ted talk that's in like the top five Ted talks of all times. Um, So yeah, I'm not sure people are as familiar with her work, but it's that idea of doing, because she's a great example of like doing the mercury, but in a way that has led to some really productive outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. That's Um, a great example. I like that when you mentioned Mercury and Sag, I always think of um, Rob Hand as my favorite Mercury and Sag example because he's yep. somebody. If you go to like a Rob Hand lecture, like he, instead of focusing in on the details and the little things, he's like a very big picture type guy, and he also has this tendency to go on these very long discursions where he'll be talking about a topic and then it'll bring up like another topic and then there'll be like a twenty minute digression. And, Except the digression is usually like very charming and interesting, and everyone's very fascinated by this long journey that you go through during the course of the talk via the digressions. Um, and he's sort of made that work out for him in being able to be a big picture person that captures and sort of synthesizes everything, and then instead of focusing in on the little details. It's fantastic. Totally been there for some of those. Yeah, definitely. Um, all right, so that was my one topic. Um, there's another topic that came up recently. Uh, let's see about what signifies like the mind in the chart versus the body versus the native communicating. So I had just this like tweet of I was trying to think of single keywords for each of the seven traditional planets. And what I threw out based on sort of a Hellenistic thing was, Sun, sun as mind, moon as body, Mercury as speaking, Venus uh, love, Mars fight, Jupiter grow, and Saturn consolidate. I thought those were all defensible significations, although some of the feedback I got was funny because there were some people that really objected to that in terms of whether to switch up the sun and moon or Mercury, which is sometimes associated with the mind in modern astrology and some of the different traditional approaches. Like I know in Indian astrology, for example, the moon is the mind. And obviously a lot of this comes down to how you define some of these things. Yeah, mind is um a slippery word. Yeah. And in Greek I was thinking of the signification of um noose which Valens assigns to the sun, and that is sometimes translated as mind, and the moon is often just translated in Valens as the body. But um, yeah, I brought up an interesting question, because there's also like a sect issue, which is um, which one is the sect light and which one is emitting light versus which one is more dark at that time. And you could make an argument that maybe like the sect light has some role to play in the source of light and therefore almost like consciousness or mind in the person's mm-hmm. life, but a- awareness. Sure. Mm. But uh, what do you guys think? Where do you come down? Do you assign like mind or consciousness to one of those significators, or how do you usually describe them? I would definitely give body to the moon. Okay. When when I'm talking about health stuff in the chart or you know, looking at some of the medical astro, the moon is always implicated as one of the two planets describing the body. The other one is the ruling planet of the ascendant that I find between those two, we get a lot of the body. Uh, The sun, I often use the idea of wisdom, which I think is probably getting closer to noose for the sun. 
What um, was that? Wisdom? Wisdom. Like the okay. idea of the sun as like divine light, if you like, right. that there is some wise, higher quality to to whatever the sun might be emitting. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because there's also like a separate issue about where does the ascendant fit into this? Yeah. The, the first house. Well, I what would say that- well, so uh, in in answer to that question about the ascendant, anything and the planet that rules the ascendant and any planet present in the the first the sign of the ascendant will will should impact uh, all judgments of both body and mind. Mm. Right. Um, I, I I do see the how should we say the sun as being uh, um, uh, more subtle. In its significations and the moon being more manifest in its significations. Um, I do I think that with the sun you see the image of self, right? Which is the containing structure for the identity, which changes from time to time. Um, I see both of them as uh, as giving as both being luminaries, um, providing awareness and vision. Um, you know, vision of the world, vision of the self, being, you know, awareness and the ability to see are very tightly correlated. Um, one of, the, I do one see- of the things that that raises for me is that in modern astrology, they often associate the sun with ego, but ego is seen as like not real. And so in modern astrology, there's been this rejection of the sun as like the true representation of the self, but instead seeing it as more not transitory, but more illusory in some way and not the actual person. Yeah, I, I so I've taught I've taught it as both for a long time, um, using the physical metaphor of the construction of the sun. Uh, the core of the sun is uh, I don't know I think it's thousands of times hotter than the uh, the edge or the corona, um, and the I would say that the sun is both the the structure. Uh, or mask um, that is the ego at any given moment. You know how the uh, mm. what what we think we are, and we need one of those to contain that energy. But it is also the energy of self which fills that structure, um, which mm. you know which could fill any structure. You know it's the same. Se- it's the same um, awareness of self, like basically ego energy. Which we, you know, which um, filled one structure when we were five, and filled another when we we're thirty, and fills another one now. So I would say that the sun is both of those things, um, and I agree that the the moon. I always look at the moon when I look for bodily injury, but I will also, or I mean, or the health of the body, right? Mm. Being concerned about injury or disease, um, but the sun also has a very strong role to play. In terms of a person's vitality, yeah, um, uh, you know, and vitality is um, is more has a kind of an energy matter relationship to the body that it animates. But that animating power is um, it's there's a physically animating power to the sun that is also important uh, for both um, mental and physical health. Just like when, for example, when a person has the Saturn go over their sun um, and they go through a period of depression and that has emotional and psychic uh, repercussions, mm-hmm. the body, uh, the person also has less physical vitality. Yeah. If you met, if you, you know, if you do exercise testing on people who are clinically depressed versus when they're not depressed, um, they can lift less weight. They can't run as far, et cetera, et cetera. But if I were going to say primary body, moon. Primary psyche, sun. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and that makes complete sense to me. Um, things just get complicated sometimes with the sect thing and what, because especially the question of in a day chart, that's easy, but in a night chart, if the moon is where the sun, where the light is coming from and the sun is dark during that part of the day, how then do you describe the role that the sun is playing versus the role that the moon is playing? And then there's an ex- a separate, like extended question that I haven't worked out, which is again separately when you start dealing with like a lot of spirit and a lot of fortune, which are meant to isolate certain qualities of the sun and moon at that p- point, and 
you know, what role do those play at that point in describing characters of the spirit or the native psyche versus characteristics of the native's body and physical incarnation? Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, and then, yeah, Sylvie's mentioning in the chat, of course, the important metaphor of how the ascendant in the first place were always in ancient astrology signified both the the body as well as the the mind or the character of the native, and that's why you get those significations with mm. the first house. But then, how is that distinct then from some of these other things that we were talking about, of the first house being the meeting point between the body and mind, and therefore the point of physical incarnation of the native? Um, but yeah, it gets a little tricky. I mean, for I was thinking of trying to come up with a single signification if I was to apply to the houses, I would just say first house self, which is opposite to seventh house other, and then tenth house public versus fourth house private. Mm -hmm. If I were to try to like Twitterify my significations and just like come up with like one signification that you have to say for each thing, that would be the most bare essential I could come up with. Yeah, that works. Self, that, that would work. The first. Yeah, self for sure. Yeah, because it describes like the mannerism and the the quality of the individual. If that yeah, makes sense. And it, and it has yeah. what's weird about it is it has a lot deeper implications that you realize until you go through a heavy first house transit and you actually yeah. have questions of what who who am I and what is yeah. myself and how am I distinct from like other people and um, it's something that sounds like a very generic signification to give to the first house until you start. Having a real period of dealing with like first house questions and issues. Yeah. 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 It seems general until you live through something that really amplifies the depth of it. Well, right. just or, ask yourself, who am I? Or yeah. yeah. It gives you a question, a crisis have, of like, who, who am I? Have yeah. I always, have I always been this? Will I always be that? You know, come up with a sufficient definition. It'll take you a couple years. Little while. Right. And what is the distinction between how I perceive myself versus how others are perceiving me when you realize there's a disconnect between those two? Yeah. yeah, that there's space between what you think you're putting out and what other people actually get. Is self what I identify with? Or yeah. is it something other than that? Well, I identified with this part of me before and this part now, but am am I different? Or, you know, anyway, yeah. Very it's, like existential questions. Yeah. 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 So, um, well, so there's anybody... some food for thought. <laughs> yeah. Food for thought. Well, uh, so let me um, just um, before we move on or leave off, just a little bit for the um, the Vedic point of view on the moon as mind, right? Mm. So the way that I was taught um, was to look at the to look at the moon um, and its aspects and its mansion, um, and to understand what are what is the basic what is the, how should we say, what is the basic, what is the reaction tendency of a person's mind? And by mind here, we don't mean intellect, mm -hmm. but um, how does a person process interaction or stimuli, right? And so if a person has, let's say, you know, Mars, Saturn configured to their moon like I do, um, then the first reaction will be to look for the negative or to look for problems to solve. And there'll be a tendency for the mind to um, what's the word? Um, uh, to have a baseline did lose the sound? that's, that's oh. you know, that's. Oh, did, did a, you lose? Just for a brief second, but you're back. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you'd look at the, the mansion, right? Be like, oh, okay, so a person's like, I've got my moon in Rohini, right? So it's um, the, the, the baseline reaction would be, well, what can I build out of this? What can I make out of this? It's a creative uh, nakshatra. But then it's configured to Mars and Saturn. So it's like, ah, that's a bunch of shit. I perceive uh, the negative, but then what can I build out of that? And so, and then you bring all of the, you know, the person's capabilities in, into, um, uh, into the equation. But the idea is that the moon, the moon can give you information about a person's basic um, sort of reaction to whatever experiences come their way, um, which is, you know, uh, it, 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 which is a different mm, sub definition or function of mind than some of the other ones we've been talking about. It has nothing to do with intellect, for example. Sure. Right. 
Yeah, well, then that's a whole other conceptual structure and tradition. And I, I wondered sometimes if mind didn't become more of the focus in the Indian tradition, partially not just due to philosophically, but because they had a more moon-based lunar tradition from the very start because of the focus on the nakshatras in indigenous Indian astrology, basically, versus in the West, there's been this focus more on the sun sign from the very beginning, especially to the extent that the zodiac itself um, is, at least the tropical zodiac is solar based or is based on the relationship between like the sun and the equinoxes and solstices. Yeah, yeah. Well, and one of the things that, that's worth noting is that in Parashara, for example, uh, there are several planets that are said to give intelligence. Mm -hmm. Intelligence is not necessarily mind. Like Everybody has mm -hmm. mind. Some people are intelligent, and different planets give different types of intelligence. And intelligence isn't necessarily intellectual excellence, mm -hmm. right? Like Mercury gives intellectual excellence, um, but Mars gives intelligence. It gives mechanical intelligence, right? Jupiter mm. gives intelligence and, you know, helps with, um, with uh, the intellect, but is not as clever as Mercury. But intelligence and mind are not exactly the same thing. Whereas we have a very, in our culture, we have a very flat, um, underworded uh, language for the, that layer of things. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, the different things that the planets contribute to that, to intelligence or to wisdom, like discretion versus like ingenuity versus uh, other keywords like that. Yeah, or just vitality of mind, right? Some people have, uh, uh, you know, they have vital minds, right? Their mind, like whatever mach intellectual machinery they have. Um, it's just always running, right? Versus mm. some people are very intelligent, but they don't have much mental energy, right? Or uh, you know, we experience this where there's like us when we're smart, when we're like uh, everything is firing, and then there's us, you know, the rest of the time where it's like, uh, I don't know, I'll figure it out later, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that makes me think of like what Saturn contributes sometimes when it's combined with either like let's say a third house or Mercury and gets involved in the native's communication process or the intellect and some of those where it can be like highly um, critical, like when you have Saturn involved in that and the, the sort of positive level of criticism versus a negative level of criticism that they can bring. And Kelly, you're shaking your head, yeah? Yeah, yeah, no, totally. I, because my my father has a Mercury Saturn conjunction, so mm -hmm. I grew up with that energy. And it's, I mean, his is in Leo, but I think Mercury Saturn is very dry and the critique is not a personal thing. It's like a critique in the more academic sense of like, let's assess the validity or the the weightiness of what is being discussed, if you like. And there is a real sense of, you know, there's a structure and form to things and we need to sort of critique whether this fits the form, whether it's an indicative of a new form or whether it's outside the form and therefore it's a rubbish sort of concept, basically. Well, having a Mercury ruled Saturn in the third, I don't know what y'all are talking about. No. Right. This is totally unfamiliar to you. <laughs> no, no. in truth, I feel called out by this relatable content. <laughs> well, I mean, one of the memories of my dad growing up, and I might have shared this story before, is the red pen correcting the newspaper. Mm. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. So he his sort of structure, particularly with language, you know, was so profound that I mean, this was back in the days when newspapers actually did have like copy editors and proof editors, not like today when necessarily things are just kind of churned out a bit. But yeah, so. But what's interesting is like some of that is just the again with Mercury, like the communication function, and it might not be what's underlying it in terms of the underlying almost like intellectual vitality or, or whatever the wisdom is emanating from. It's just a means through which it's being communicated, is being altered in some instances by or, or conditioned by, let's say, conjunction with Saturn or what have you. Right. And that's like, a, I think a good example of that is someone with Tourette's, right, who mm. you know will scream obscenities randomly that's not necessarily indicative. That's not, that's literally not what they're trying to communicate. Right. Right. Mm. But, like uh, and most of us don't thing. have, yeah, most of us don't have disorders that are that obvious, but a lot of us don't end up saying it exactly how we wanted to. 
Yeah. Or like that would be like a Mars thing, or like sometimes in the older text, they'll say that Saturn Mercury stuff pertains to like speech impediments. So if there was like a, mm -hmm. some other impediment that was impeding the ability to communicate what is internally going on. Mm. Yep. Yeah, and the contrast to offer something energetically different or antithetical, to use our analogy Ooh. from before, is like a Mercury-Venus aspect, for instance, which is going to have a lot more moisture. And the first example that comes to mind is Maya Angelou, who has Mercury and Venus conjunct in Pisces, and the poetry and the artistry to communication there, the fluidity, you know, maybe not necessarily conforming to rigid structure, but evocative uh, nonetheless. Yeah, I love that. She's a great example for that. Um, so all of this though goes back to- Your for tweet. Me, <laughs> well, not just the tweet, but astronomically, when you look at the solar system, Mercury is the planet that is closest to the sun. Mm. And it's like the gateway and the one that you have to the go between, between the sun and the other planets. And so that's why sometimes when I think about this, I do think about the sun as if not the mind, like the thing that is within the person that has some sort of consciousness or some sort of knowledge that they want to express, and then it gets expressed through Mercury as the sort of gatekeeper and the go be between uh, between the sun as like the central force of everything and the rest of the planets. And I think almost astronomically, that's why we end up with Mercury playing this role of. Um, communication or of the go between in different situations. And it's because of that astronomical setup of Mercury being the planet next to the sun that you have to go through to get back and forth between them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. To um, For any of the sun's beams to get to the other layers of the solar system, it has to pass through Mercury's ring. Right. Yeah. So the wisdom of the sun comes through Mercury according to whatever planets Mercury is in aspect to or otherwise influenced by. Yeah, although it's funny then because then you get the situations just in natal charts where you have the person that has Mercury in the same sign as the Sun, um, mm -hmm. and maybe there is more of a you know a concordance between um, you know what is in inside the person in some sense in their consciousness versus the way that they communicate that versus you know those people that have the Sun in a different sign than Mercury. Um, which just like circling all the way back around is one of the reasons why like Eminem is such a funny example because he's a sun in Libra but a Mercury in Scorpio, and the way that he communicates some of those things is very like abrasive and dark and uh, occasionally aggressive. But it's interesting, sort of what's underlying some of that compared to the way that he communicates it. Hmm. So that somehow there's a smoothness or a purity of message when Mercury and the Sun are in the same sign, and there's a disjointed jerkiness when the Mercury and the Sun are in adjacent signs. Yeah, just because they're in aversion and they're in um, signs that have completely different qualities and like modes mm. and everything else, and so the way that the person is communicating sometimes comes off differently than the way that they might feel to themselves. Um, and this is actually, I think, one of the issues when it comes to sun sign astrology in terms of um, people gauging that, that some of the people that have more of their personal planets all in the same sign might relate more to just like one sign versus um, you know, having their Mercury or their Venus in different signs than their sun and not being able to relate as much to just one singular sign. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Super cool. All right. Well, um, I think that's that's it. I got a few other topics, but nothing that's really jumping out. Unless you guys have any major topics that you wanted to discuss astrologically before we wrap up the forecast for uh, November. Um, I will. I'll just add one more layer to Sun and Moon. So in uh, let's say more Renaissance era stuff, especially in the intersection between astrology and alchemy. You get sun is spirit and moon is soul in a yeah. lot of ways. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's still, uh, so spirit being the more raw emanation of a motivated awareness, and then soul 
um, while still being more psychic than the body, soul is a collection of experiences and structures uh, in a way uh, in a way that the that spirit is not. Spirit being a more raw form of a of energy and awareness, and the uh, yeah soul being a collection of of how should we say charged patterns um, that that spirit illuminates or fuels. I'll have, nice. to, I'll have to think about that uh, because there's usually so much uh, otherwise like a collapsing of meanings when it comes to soul and spirit in yeah a these are the, these are specific these, these are specific definitions of that I'm trying to give a, a quick version of right people will say spirit for kind of anything and people will say soul for kind of anything yeah yeah definitely um all right, last discussion topic, and this is a brief one that will just take a minute, but are we living in a simulated reality? Oh my lord, this again? Did we already discuss this? No, no, I just, didn't we have a brief something? Well, maybe that's my answer to your question. Okay. No, uh, well, <laughs> I did think we had some, some matrix level discussion a little while, it was a while ago though, but maybe I just imagined that we did. Maybe that's like a glitch in the matrix. Well, I just bring it up because occasionally I see it come up as like a popular like sci-fi theory. But I always thought that like astrology would be the best example of if something like that did happen. Because if it did exist, then there would be theoretically some sort of underlying code that would be describing what's going on in reality that you might be able to access on some underlying level. And I'm not saying that's definitely what's happening. I'm just saying astrology would be an interesting way to conceptualize that, or that would be an interesting way to conceptualize astrology and what it's doing if you wanted to approach it from that standpoint. Yeah, I would agree. Um, you know, and are we living in a simulation? Um, are there, which is a way of asking, are there layers of reality that are more real, uh, which I think we would say more causal than this one? Yeah, probably. I would say yes. There are probably also layers that are even less real and less causal than this one. I think there's, um, I don't know, I, my sense of it cosmologically is probably kind of similar to what uh, the structure that Robert Zelazny lays out in the books of Amber, uh, which are fiction, by the way. Um, but, you know, because we can do things, you know, and I would say that, yeah, I, I would agree that. Uh, astrology is a good way to look at things that are, oh, how should we say, more consistently real than other layers of facts. And then I would say that astrological magic or magic in general is then acting um, at those more real or more causal levels, um, which might not be visible at this level uh, in order to have, in order to create a cascade of desired effects or situations. What do you think, Kelly? Well, I don't know if this is like an a lazy You're like de answer. deeply unsettled by this question. No, I just I no, I sort of think but if we are or if we aren't, we have to keep going on regardless. Okay. So like, you're not I, I sort of think if we are living in a simulation, we'll know at some point and then we can deal with whatever we need to, do you know what I mean I'm like this yeah. to my mind I'm like in I don't know if this is being dismissive I just feel like well if we are great if we're not we're still gonna get up tomorrow chop wood carry water kind of thing yeah that it's immaterial or it doesn't make a huge difference because you're you're in it and it's a matter of living your life at this stage yeah that's kind of where I um go with this question you know, I think that if you know if we're going to use a matrix an analogy, it matters if there are there if we have an ability to access and and read and or manipulate the code, right? If yeah. um, even if we are in a simulation, if there is no um, if we have no capacity to read or change that code, then it becomes completely immaterial. But if there is an ability to read or access it, then it um, then it has a most definite impact, um, and it, it's worth pursuing uh, as a you know 
a method of living one's life. Yeah, and that was actually the episode I did earlier this month with um, on astrology and Christianity, and if astrology was antithetical to Christianity, because I'm still convinced that one of the selling points for like Christianity really early on that we don't understand today, but would have made a much more sense in the ancient world, was that they were basically saying like it gives you a cheat code if you become Christian to like get out of your birth chart and like get out of your fate. And that's really appealing, I feel like, especially if you're living in a first century context where most of the astrologers are taking a much more deterministic approach to astrology, where they think that everything's predetermined, or at least most things are predetermined, and the purpose of astrology is just to know what you have to accept in the future. But if somebody comes along and says, maybe you don't, maybe you can erase all of that, um, then that, that would be very, very appealing. Yeah, well, and I think that that's further supported by a lot of the uh, early, uh, the Gnostic Christianity, where the archons, who are the uh, cruel or unjust controllers of the manifest world, literally have the names of the planets in a lot of documents. Right. Well, the archons are like the gatekeepers of the planets, and you're descending, the soul descends through the planetary mm. spheres, and it takes on all these qualities. And then when you and, die, it ascends back through the planetary spheres and gives the qualities back. But well, but in that archonic uh, Gnostic uh, perspective, the those planets once you've descended, um, literally have as a job to keep you ignorant and weak. And so that that ascent uh, through those spheres was not natural, but required you know whatever Gnostic tech uh, they were using. And so yeah, that would be you know it, we literally have systems. Um, para-Christian systems that see the planets as the enemies, um, as the cruel arbiters of, uh, how should we say it, uh, the, the cruel arbiters of an arbitrary fate as decided by the flawed creator of this world. And so, you know, if the Jesus was a way out of that, then yeah, hell yeah, people are, people would be into that. Right. Um, but even like the magical traditions, that was that was just like one alternative. But there's the Hermetic traditions. There's like the magical traditions. There are a bunch of different like alternates or different groups that were trying to provide like an answer for a way out or to change your fate. And I just feel like that's such a different mindset that people were dealing with, and why some of those philosophies would have been appealing compared to modern times, where modern like late twentieth century, especially astrology, was so radically different, and it's stance towards fate and free will that it's almost not comprehensible to us to understand what that would have been like in the first century. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The, I can totally see the first century desire to want to, because it, in all ways, whether it, it was Christian orientation or other magical practices, was this uh, promise of giving people some kind of control over their life and, and what was happening, that you could escape this path by going down this road instead. Yeah. Right. People, people are always into that and with good reason. You yeah. Know, that's, that's what- um, That still that, happens that, today. Well, yeah. That's, I would say that that's healthy. Yeah. Right? Um, <laughs> if, if, yeah. Uh, if your path is barred, you look for a way around, um, you know? And you may or may not find one, but just assuming that when you hit a roadblock, be like, yep, there's a block in the road. I should probably just accept that, you know? I mean, what, when, when do you, especially with like, let's say a client or even personally say, establish that there's something you have to accept versus something that you have to actively strive to change? Well, it depends, right? Um, I, I think a lot of times the answer is wait. Um, you know, something I, you know, it, it just really depends on how, how should we say, how many testimonies there are to things being a particular way and yeah. how permanent those are. Yep. Right. Yeah. Um, because, you know, there, and there are some, you know, to give it a sort of a dramatic example, there may be some, oh, okay. So there are some lives where people have um, extremely unsatisfying love lives, but then when they're 65, they meet exactly the perfect person and they finish out their years in love and harmony. Now, if you were able to predict that, which is 
Not completely unlikely, whether you should predict that is another thing, but whether you could predict that if you did to someone um, at, at 15 or you know 20, that would sound unbelievably horrible. But yet we know that that happens. And so obviously, mm. if we're looking at a chart like that, there are big afflictions to the seventh um, and to Venus, likely in the ruler of the seventh. Um, but that though, but time periods change later in life, so as to you know maybe they hit um, a, a unique and wonderful releasing from Eros period where those are mitigated uh, or where those don't apply for a period of time. Um, and so you know, I mean, there is. I don't think I don't know if anything is forever. Some things might be for an entire lifetime. Um, but you know, you just got to kind of judge it with all the factors you understand. Yeah, definitely. Um, all right. Well, I think that kind of brings us to the end of this episode since we're at two and a half hours. So thanks guys for joining me for the forecast today. I'm excited about having both of you here in Denver and recording our next two, two forecasts in person. Yeah. Next. Uh, yeah. Next that's going to be a real treat. Yeah, so next episode's going to be live and in person, yeah? Yes. It's definitely going to be in, definitely going to be in person in like a month from now. What what day are we recording that on? The 24th? Yeah, just over 4 weeks. Okay. And I'm working on a way to live stream that for all of the patrons who want to attend live. Thanks to all the patrons who attended this episode live. We had almost 100 people here today, which is awesome and we love seeing the chats from everybody. Yes. Um, yeah, I don't have it worked out yet, but I'm going to find some way to live stream that. So I'll figure it out uh, for when we're recording that next month. And we're going to record a bunch of episodes here in person. So looking forward to that. Um, and Kelly, you got your plane tickets booked. Austin, you're about to book yours. Mm -hmm. We got the house almost booked. Let's, I actually, we'll get that I, I, tr I tried to book my plane tickets, but the, uh, the website for Alaska Airlines fucked up. So I have to do it again. Also, can we can we dress as like news anchors if we're all going to be around the desk? <laughs> yeah, well, it's going to be we're, we'll have to consider a lot of things like that. So okay, packing tips. <laughs> right. Uh, all right, and then before I wrap up, I needed needed to thank the uh, patrons. So let's see, can you see that? Oh yeah, the Patreon supporters. That's come up. Yep, nice. Yeah. So these yeah. are people on the new twenty five dollar tier, which I really appreciate because it's helping us to fund some of this stuff, like kicking in money for a place for Austin and Kelly next month. So thanks to the patrons, uh, especially Christine Stone, Nate Craddock, the Astro Gold Astrology app available at astrogold.io, which is the app that I use on my phone. Also thanks to the Portland School of Astrology at portlandastrology.org. And of course, the Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs, which are available at honeycomb.co. All right, guys. So thanks for joining me today. Thanks, everyone, for watching this episode of the Astrology Podcast. Please be sure to like, subscribe on YouTube, uh, subscribe on Patreon, and give us a good review on iTunes. And uh, I think that's it. So we will see everybody next time. And uh, good luck in the month of November. Ninja November. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Take care.